Night gathers, and now our podcast begins. It shall not end until we're done talking. We are the princes that were promised. Welcome to the princes that were promised. It's me, it's Shawnee Wan, and joining me, as always, the warden of Nassau County, the supreme leader of all spoilers. And honestly, I'm not exactly sure where he stands on today's topic. It's John. John, I feel like you're not a huge Daenerys Targaryen fan. But do you hate her? As the great Derek Smalls would say, she's kind of like lukewarm water. She's She is a lukewarm water. Sure. Yeah, I agree with that. Don't hate her. Don't love her. Just in the middle. Has there, has there ever been a moment in the TV series in which you were either impressed by her or her stock rose for you? I guess it fluctuates. And I don't like the, um, I'm sure we're going to talk about it, you know, the, uh, when she's in the uh, Kalasar coming out like, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, from the uh, Fantastic Four. Huh? But the Fantastic Four. Who's the guy? Johnny, uh... Oh, you're talking about in season... In season six. Yeah. Right, yeah. No, I'm not a fan of that either. Yeah, she's coming out like... <laughs> like the human torch. <laughs> Flame on! <laughs> uh, Flame on, yeah. <laughs> like, I, like, I liked her... I was trying to think, I'm like, the invisible woman? What is he talking about? <laughs> I liked her in uh, seasons one and two, but then like three, four, five, or four, five, she was okay. And say you take ebbs and flows, you know? Does any of your feeling towards the character of Daenerys Targaryen, does it feel like it's influenced by your love for Jon Snow and her positioning? as the de facto hero of this series, at least early on. Early on, I would definitely say yes. You know, because, you know, let's, first of all, for, you know, let's, let's all be, uh, let, let's, just, let's just all get it straight. She, her official title is Princess Daenerys of the House Targaryen. Yes. She is, she is no queen. I know I'll get a lot of flack for that one, but going by official titles, that's what she is. Well, if we're getting technical, then it's, you know, she's, she, she may be queen of Marine. I'm not sure how they make a, a title like that official, but in Westeros, since Aegon the Conqueror united the seven kingdoms under his rule, every king is not a king until they're anointed as king by the faith of the seven, which she has not been. And I don't even, I'm not even so sure that Game of Thrones is going to go there. I don't think they have time to go there, but with that in mind, I mean, she's, she can call herself queen, but by rules established by her own, you know, uh, her own, uh, I don't know, great, 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 grandfather. She's not queen. She ain't queen until she's anointed. And I would assume that I'm I'm assuming that Cersei's been anointed. Point being, she can call us another usurper. Yeah, she she's not a queen. In this case, she looks like a queen, smells like a queen, talks like a queen, but she ain't a queen. Um Do you recall how old Daenerys Targaryen is at the beginning of A Game of Thrones? 13. So, in 13? Mm-hmm. Okay. 
they don't mention how old she is in the TV show, but she has to be at least 18, right? Uh, I'm trying to even like remember, like, you know, have they, did they, have they ever really given the ages of uh, the TV show characters? I, I don't know if I have any, no. any official, you know, I, I know like Kit Harrington's like 29 years old. I mean, obviously, you know, eight years ago, he was 21. Is that, you know, is that how they're going to try to play off Jon Snow? Eight years ago, he was 21. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I guess it just kind of falls into that, into that realm of the actors look young so we can put an age on them and that's the age they want us to put on these characters. Like if we do, if we try to do math and figure out their ages in the TV show, it won't match up with the age the actors look. You know, Daener- Daenerys Targaryen, Amelia Clark, she looks young enough in season one. Young enough to be considered young, but she's obviously an adult. Nowhere near the age of 13. Mm-hmm. And it's pretty obvious that she's older than 18 also. So, yeah, I guess, they, you know, leaving the ages out, you just kind of assign an age to these characters in your mind. Um, and George, you know, George R. R. Martin said that the character of Daenerys Targaryen was aged significantly in the television series because of child pornography regulations. And obviously that's the case. For, that's really, for, that's really the reason for everybody's yeah, aging. Like it's just, not just hold it there. Yeah. You, you can definitely even say like, uh, you know, Sansa, you know, there's definitely moments, right. uh, in season two and, you know, in book two where she's going through her, um, her, right. her, 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 uh, avenues of being a woman that you, you know, if you, you know, if you had a, 15 year old girl even you know to portray that on the show uh, it, it would definitely be looked upon as kind of uh have a bad taste in your mouth yeah, yeah. like yeah get the lawyers <laughs> get this show off the, get this show off the freaking airways well, uh, i don't understand what the problem is I mean, <laughs> this happened all the time <laughs> it's a, as far as i know it's a very accurate depiction of a, of a young girl's journey into womanhood um have you ever seen a picture of the actress originally cast as Daenerys? Yes. Uh, I only saw it for the first time today. I'm not sure why I never looked at this if before. I'm thinking but, of the picture what it is, yeah, not Nikki. Yeah, Tamsin Merchant is her name. And now, what uh, was the reason why they didn't go with her? You know what? I can't find that out. It just it, it says that um, she was uh, – Amelia Clark replaced her. When they reshot the pilot, and then, um, and that's really gotta be a bummer, you know. It's like you, you, you went does this pilot, uh, they they shoot the pilot, they show the pilot, and it's like it's it's not good. And then all of a sudden they come back, and then really, you know, the, the directors and writers like, oh, we gotta change some things, you know, probably you know, most on their end. They were like, oh wait, hold on, we we, we found another actress. You're fired. <laughs> You're fired. Or if it, if it was something like, um, if it was something like she wasn't available, she definitely has to fire her agent. You know, uh, uh, no official reason. No official reason has been given for her departure. But George R. R. Martin chimes in and reports that there were no problems with her performance in the role. It's like, dude, has not- George ever said a bad thing about anything about any of the, any of the show? Like Outside you- the fact that now, like, oh, well, they're gone past me. I would have done things like that. Yeah. Uh, wasn't, was it, uh, Catelyn was replaced also, mm-hmm. right? Oh, dude, there's this picture of, uh, a different Illyrio Mopatis, who actually looks a lot better. Really? That's disheartening. I, I, yeah. I don't want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, Jennifer L. originally played Catelyn Stark. Um, they had a different guy playing Jared. I don't know what 
<laughs> it's kind of a silly role to recast. Yeah, like uh, we <laughs> did forget to play Sir Waymar Royce. We need a total recast on this. And then Pycelle was originally cast as uh, Roy Dotrice was cast as mm-hmm. Pycelle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that one I knew. That one I knew. That also it's the guy from uh, Empire. Yeah, Julian Glover. He's the guy from Empire and the guy from uh, Indiana Jones, yep. Last Crusade. I just want to see a picture of Jennifer L. real quick to see if maybe I wouldn't hate her as much. Ah, oh, man, that sucks for her. She was in a 1995 BBC Mooney series, and she was cast as Catelyn Stark. And then she announced she was leaving the project and has done not much at all since then. Oh, actually, no. In a subsequent interview, L. said that she loved the books and the project but that it was too soon after the birth of her daughter and she didn't want to commit to such a long running role Mm -hmm. while raising a family. I feel like I should, I I should send you these pictures, but she looks, uh, I feel like she looks a lot better um, for Catelyn Stark than Michelle Fairley. So what's her name? Jennifer L E H L E. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, might have to dye her hair. Like she's a blonde, you might have to dye her hair. But oh my god, yeah, definitely. Right? She she like looks young. Like Michelle Fairley. No offense to Michelle Fairley, but looks like she too looks, old. Yeah, like older than Ned. Almost. And she looked. And the picture I see here on IMDb, I mean, I'm not saying she looks like Sansa, uh, like Sophie Turner, but. A lot more like yeah. Sophie Turner. You can see that's where they actually got the look from. Mm-hmm. Yeah, odd thing about the Starks, none of them really, the, the actors playing the Starks, mm-hmm. none of them really look like one another. Like they all have, they all look pretty much distinctly different from one another. I'd say the closest is probably like Rob and Rickon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they don't, uh, let's see, let's get some more pictures here. Oh, I would totally would have. Oh, yeah, this is. Maybe it was like a last, like a last second thing, like they were about to reshoot the pilot. And she's like, "Whoops, I'm she's out. Like, I, I can't do it." And Michelle Fairley was just like hanging around, waiting. It's a conspiracy. They're like, "You guys have to shoot now, or it'll it'll never happen." Yeah, <laughs> the time is now. Your choices are Michelle Fairley or Cher or Barbara Streisand. <laughs> or Barbara she's Streisand. a good friend. She's a good friend. <laughs> Or Kathy Bates. One of the four. You have to choose now. Um, anyway. Back to Daenerys. Right, back on target. Stay on target. Stay on target. So, Amelia Clark has, um, you know, she's made that role her own. And Tamzine Merchant, I, I definitely think she looks the part of a Targaryen. You know, maybe just looking at photos more so than Amelia Clark, but. Um, character aside, what do you think of Amelia Clark as Daenerys? Um, just like the character ebbs and flows. There's like certain parts where it's just like almost kind of like Tyrion in a way. It's just like, all right, oh, we get it, we get it, right. you know. <laughs> yeah, I kind of I, if I, I think I'm picking up what you're putting down, I feel like she kind of. I feel like she mails in her performance at certain points. And maybe that's because her storyline is, ju- you know, just like Tyrion's, it ebbs and flows a little too much. You know, the dramatic highs. I mean, she's had she's had some real dramatic highs. Mm-hmm. You oh, know, definitely. Like this, the scene with the at the end of season one with the dragons. Um, and, I mean, I think that's the most iconic. And... Likely that's the best scene, excluding whatever happens in the final episodes. That's probably her best scene. But another real good one was the um, burning of the the burning of the great masters, mm-hmm. which that was season three. Yes, episode episode ten. Oh, that was after the red wedding. I thought it was no. No, I don't think so. That's when they call yeah. That's when they call Misa. 
And that, that's right. Right, 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 right. Which was not a dramatic high. That was just like, all right, we get it. You're like Jesus. Um, but just keep them. We go when we go to season three. Just keep that scene in mind, so I don't forget. But so I don't want to say now. I don't want to go out, out of order here or anything like that. Right. Well, I think up until the red wedding, that that was the most talked about scene in season three. Um, obviously, people thought it was the highlight of season three until the red wedding came along, and uh, that dwarfs any other scene in comparison. But that was a, a major, major you know, climactic moment for the character. But since then, I can really only think of the Dragon Pit more so than the Battle of Ice, Battle of Fire in Season 6, the Dragon Pit in Season 5. I wish they could go back and redo that, like this, like redo her going on to Drogon, because it just seemed a little flimsy there. Yeah. I think like now if they did that, I think I think it would have been well, shot don't... so much better, because I think they have to, you know, a little more money, a little more... Right. The experience had a really it, – it, it just looked a little like – it looked like episode two Star Wars Attack of the Clones a little bit. You know, like Natalie Portman, you know, just hopping on a rhino type thing. It just seemed a little off. Yeah. Well, I mean, off subject, sort of, but you have to give credit to Natalie Portman for that because, you know, in 2002, that sort of acting was unheard of. You know, everything was digital, whereas, whereas now, you know, a lot of actors that have worked on major stuff, they have – at least some experience with mm-hmm. heavy CGI and, and digital characters. The actors in episode two, they were just winging it. Because episode one, that had a lot of digital, but it had a lot of practical effects also. It was episode two that was mm-hmm. all digital. But yeah, that they call it the uncanny valley. You know, the, the space between what we recognize as real and what we know is not real. The space in between that is the uncanny valley. And it was a gaping wide uncanny valley in episode two. And I'm sure it hasn't aged that well because these digital effects have gotten so much better. So with Daenerys in season five, it was like, yes, the first time they did it, I'm sure they had time constraints and obviously budgetary constraints, but they've done it enough times now and they have no budgetary problems for, you know, season six, seven, and eight. But yeah, it would be, it would be nice even like for a Blu-ray full series release or something just to kind of. Redo that scene, make it a little bit better. Amelia Clark calls Daenerys Targaryen a very Joan of Arc style character. And when was when was it that she stopped doing nude scenes? She said she wouldn't do any more nude scenes. Oh, do you remember that? Oh boy, what season? Because uh... for, uh, first Dario got to see her. Yeah, I think that was the last time that we I mean, saw. I'm going to so it season four, I think. First Dario was season three. So season four, I think, is when she stopped. Yeah. Yeah, once they get the new Dario, she's like, you know what? I'm not getting naked for another yeah, Dario. Yeah, not liking this guy. <laughs> That's it. You know what? I've got some heat on Broadway. <laughs> That's this guy that I'm just not attracted to. He's a little weird. I mean, he doesn't even have the same hair color. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How could I get naked in front of this guy? <laughs> Jorah Walmart's like, damn it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just one more. <laughs> one more nude scene. <laughs> one for the road. He, he makes sure he's on set that day. <laughs> <laughs> he's got like he's got like a hat and sunglasses on, and he's like he's like holding the clicky thing for like takes. Like, All right, take three. Cut, action. Cut. Redo. Retake it. We're gonna retake that one. You're not the director. Wait, who? Jora. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's so it's so funny. I know I said at the time of the um, of the episode, but when she comes out. You know, when she just burns down the uh, the Colossar, you know, season right. five, five, six. Season six, and she's, yeah. you know, she's, you know, she's full of fire, she's full of fire, she's, she's naked. You can just see Jorah, just, just watch Jorah. He's <laughs> he's bowing down, but he's making sure he's taking a peek. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's got to get those extra peeks in. <laughs> well, you know, I just wanted to make sure she wasn't burned. Yeah. <laughs> make sure, sure she Jorah. was okay. Yeah, we all believe that, Jorah. Sure. I think that's my major issue with the character of Daenerys Targaryen. You know, she may be bland at times, ebbs and flows, like you said. You know, you don't have to love everything about a character. You don't even have to hate everything about a character you don't love. A a character could just be, for the most part, inconsequential to how you enjoy a, a TV show or a movie. But when you introduce illogical things about that character, I mean, that's a big problem for me. And I'm sure we'll talk about it more, but my main issue with Daenerys Targaryen in Game of Thrones is her being fireproof. 
it's not possible for her to be fireproof. And I don't know why they went in that direction with the character. Going on to season one, our introduction to Daenerys, a very clever edit, very clever writing from Robert and Ned talking about mm-hmm. Rhaegar. I forget the exact line, but Robert says... No, no Ned says, well, they're down talking with Le- Lyanna's corrupt, and Ned's saying, it's over, the, the Targaryens are done for. And then Robert says, not all of them. Now, at that point, I mean, they showed Danny, which was, as you say, was a very savvy edit cut, you know, mm-hmm. to, now, to, to the introduction of, of Danny. Would have been kind of too obvious if all of a sudden they would have cut that to, like, to John. Not all of them. <laughs> and then you see John. <laughs> yeah, imagine they did that. <laughs> oh, man. <he's- laughs> or, like, they don't even cut to him. Like, he just, like, enters the scene. Yeah. He's like, uh, uh, Lord Stark, uh, you know, Lady Catelyn's looking for you. I don't know who my mother is, by the way. No way is it that statue you took and about right now crying in front of. <laughs> That'd be like the worst writing. <laughs> the the Targaryens are done for. Not all of them. Uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Lord Stark. Hey, it's me, Jon Snow. Um, yeah, Lady Catelyn's looking for you. What are you guys doing? Oh, you're looking at the, the statue of my Aunt Lyanna? I didn't really know her. No, I didn't know her too well. You know, I never met her, but uh, for some reason, I have a real strange attraction to the statue. Like it's it, Like, I'm always drawn to it. Anyway, I'll see you guys upstairs. Just totally give the whole thing away. But yeah, it's a clever edit to Daenerys across the Narrow Sea. And I don't know, like, what do you think that says about the character of Rhaegar as we're introduced to Daenerys? You know, knowing she's Targaryen, having just heard about how much Robert hates Rhaegar, and we're introduced to another Targaryen. And it's, it's not said outright that she's Rhaegar's sister in, in that first scene with her, but. But, you know, another Targaryen, you're. Another Targaryen, and she's obviously a protagonist, obviously a, you know, a, on on the, a character that we'd, that we'd be rooting for. It's, Does it say anything it, about Rhaegar? You think? Well, when, when I first, when I personally, when I first, you know, saw the the show, when, when I heard the name Rhaegar, it just seemed like a like an evil name. Oh, it's got Rhaegar. Yeah. It's Rhaegar. Oh God, Rhaegar. Wow, Rhaegar. That's a, he sounds like a dick. Now, I wasn't a fan of Robert either. I I, I kind of felt like you know. There's, there's some sort of truth not being told there. And I've always questioned, like, he did they not look like a king, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, too, I throw the name Rhaegar. I'm like, ah, oh, God, I don't know. Nope. Seems, no way he's a good guy. Yeah, seems a little sketchy. It's an awesome name, Rhaegar. Yeah. Maybe the best name in A Song of Ice and Fire. But we're, we're introduced to Daenerys, who is a sympathetic character, and we're, we're introduced to her other brother. Viserys, who is love not him. a sympathetic... Love him. Yeah, love him, but he's not a no. sympathetic... Well, you know what? In the long run, he is a sympathetic character, but definitely not while he's alive. Can I ask you a quick question? I mean, uh, uh, of all the, the Targaryen names, has there ever are there been another Rhaegar beforehand? No. I, I, I'm just thinking about Actually, it right now. No, no there hasn't. Uh, that's there, interesting. There's been a Viserys. I'm sure that, you know, there's been Maker, H. Harry's... Plenty of Aegons, obviously. Amons. Da- I'm sure there's a couple of Daemon Targaryens. There are a couple yeah, of Ares. I, I don't know about King Daemon Targaryens. Well, just, no, have, just, just the yeah. Daemon itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what? I, I've never thought of that before. That's a, that's a good catch. I don't, in, in all the history, you know, the Westerosi history and lore that I've read. I'm here all week, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but no, there's. I've never heard of another Rhaegar Targaryen. As a matter of fact, the only other Rhaegar I know from A Song of Ice and Fire is Rhaegar. Yeah, Frey. <laughs> Rhaegar Frey. <laughs> How shitty are the Freys? Yeah, like, you know, you're know, you the house that's going to name you when your son's yeah. after Prince Rhaegar, you know? Right, right. Of all the houses. And I believe there's a Frey named after a Lannister also. Like, they, you know, these these powerful figures throughout Westerosi history, they try to, Car- you know. Emulate. Yeah. We name Freys. him that way. He's going to be a great Frey. So when winter is coming, we're introduced to Daenerys, Viserys, and we get a bit of their backstory. Viserys feels he's the rightful king of Westeros. Daenerys doesn't seem to really care much about that. Right. Like she, it, It's like she doesn't even bother to act like she cares. She just sullenly agrees with Viserys. And who do you think is more sullen in winter is coming? Do you think Daenerys or Jon Snow is more sullen? Who's more mopey? Who's more sullen? Who's... Who's a sadder figure in episode one of Game of Thrones? I'm going to say with John. I mean, yeah, he's always been described as sad and melancholy, and they pulled that off right. You know, they pulled that off pretty well. 
I wonder what the character was me who was throughout the books was labeled as sad and melancholy. You know, it's it's. I think it's so interesting. I'm actually going to write it down. We've touched on it before. The journeys that both these characters go through, John and Daenerys. As we cover Daenerys, before we get to John, just want to make note of parallels or the similarities between the journeys they go on. You know, they're both introduced as sullen and sympathetic figures. I think Daenerys more so just because of Viserys. And we also meet Cal Drago, who she is pretty much gifted to. Yeah, forced to marry. The books is, in the books, it's a lot worse. Yeah, I, I I just really want to make sure I make sure you know, like we see this in the show. The the, the first the first sex scene is it's basically looks like this big guy, Jason. What's his uh, uh, what's his uh, Jason uh, Momoa? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, this big you know Aquaman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like in the in the books, like you just when you're reading it, it's like you 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 feel like you have to call the cops if you just read about a gang rape. You know, like just the way it's described, yeah. like how, like it's just very. This is it's, what this is what they did. I swear, <laughs> I did my research because there was so much going on in episode one in Winter Is Coming, and there's always so much going on in every episode. But I don't know if, like, how scary that situation had to be for Daenerys. I don't. I don't know if that came across. That plus the, you know, the, the aged, you know, the difference in age between the source material and the TV show. Not that it makes it a whole lot better, but it it does make it a little bit more Mm -hmm. consumable for viewers. That's a very scary situation, you know, joining the the, uh, Dothraki. That what episode did they get married? I think it's, I think episode one, right? Because she meets Jorah at at the wedding. You know, in the book, they meet, they meet Jorah. That was already, I thought that was episode two, at least. I don't think so. God damn it. Yeah, I think it's episode one that she gets married. Um, so, we, and of course, then when it, it is indeed episode one, we also have to make sure we're talking about one of the huge things there is the wedding gift of the three dragon eggs. Yes. Excuse me, how important that is. Yes. Well, how about uh, first, do you want to speak to what exactly the trade is? And that's what it is. It's not like a Westerosi marriage alliance where you're aligning two noble houses through a wedding. Mm-hmm. This is a straight up barter and trade. It's, yeah. it's a gift for a gift. Do you want to uh, just explain that, uh, you know, what Viserys is Viserys. getting? Viserys. <laughs> Viserys who will do anything to, as we said before, claim what he thinks is rightfully his. And he would still be wrong if it's not his. Um, the trade is that Khal Drago would marry his sister and he would would let any of his men <laughs> have, have, their, uh, yeah. <laughs> have their time with her. In exchange for Kyle Drago and his army, what, 40,000 horse riders to march into Westeros? That's what uh, Viserys thinks he's getting <laughs> right off the bat. Like, he thinks there's going to be a marriage. Boom, boom, boom. Two days later, we're going to Westeros with an army. We're going to get back the crown. Right. But that's not exactly how it works for no. Dothraki. <laughs> they don't go on your time, Viserys. This isn't Westeros. You know, like Viserys gave him the gift of his sister. Kyle Drogo's going to enjoy it a little bit. And he's going to bring her to, since he's marrying her, and she's going to be the Khaleesi, he's going to bring her to the Mother of Mountains, to Ves Dothrak, and present her to the Dash Khaleen. And the Dash Khaleen are, old, for the most part, older, old crones. They're former Khaleesis, whose husbands, whose the cows have been killed, uh, either died naturally or killed in battle. And when that happens... Khaleesi's duty is to return to the Mother of Mountains and function as Dash Khaleen, who are maybe a little bit prophetic, maybe a little bit um, like a witch doctor, but they are. it is a respected order. It's just a, a shitty way to live the rest of your life. So Khal Drogo is going to do all that. It's not that he, he owes Viserys Targaryen, but he has to return a gift for the gift that he got. And the gift that Viserys wants is his help retaking Westeros. It's probably likely that he'll get it. Right at the end of episode one, you're like, yeah, I'll probably get it. Yeah, that's what you think. That's what you think. That's what you definitely think is when you get. Let me ask you a question. Uh, if let's just say, for the sake of arguments, that the uh, Dothraki had no problem crossing, a, you know, an ocean of water, do right. you think forty thousand would have been enough to reclaim the throne, or whatever amount was forty thousand? Was it or how how much was the? Um... Yeah, I think I think forty thousand is the right number. I, I don't see it here, but I I, I feel like it was. I guess that could be a hundred thousand. 
you know, that's that's too much. And I feel like 50, 60, that's too much. I think it's 40,000. No, I don't. Not at that time. I feel like if if Viserys had gotten what he wanted and he crossed the narrow sea with the Dothraki and Robert was still alive, I don't think it's a battle they would have won because I think A, Westeros would unite against foreign invaders, whether or not Viserys Targaryen was leading them or not. And B, Robert really has nothing else to live for but another battle. Mm-hmm. You know, he's he's he he does not like the life that he has as king. But if he has to go to go to war, you know, he'd love to do that. And he'd have the support. You know, he'd, he'd have Lannister support and he'd have – I mean, he had support of the whole realm, maybe excluding the Martels. Greyjoys. Yeah, maybe excluding Martells and excluding the Greyjoys. But I don't think he would need, need them to take 40,000 Dothraki. I think maybe there's a battle or two that the Dothraki might win depending how much of a surprise the invasion is. But at the end of the day, they can't they can't take a castle, you know. They don't have the patience for a uh, for a siege, and they have no armor, you know. Those are big deals, uh, especially the armor. Dothraki wedding for Daenerys and Drogo, pretty crazy. And what's what's the what does Illyrio Mopata say? A Dothraki wedding without at least three deaths is considered a. Uh... And it's yeah, it's here at this wedding that we're introduced to. Sir Jorah Mormont. He kneels before Daenerys, right? And he offers her a gift of books of history. He's like, hey, how you doing? Sir Jorah. Here's my, here's a I'm book. A knight. Yeah. I'm a and, knight from uh, Westeros. And the calling card from my personal raven that he had touched me. <laughs> <laughs> now you can send that raven anytime. And uh, did I mention that I'm the lord of my own island? Well, I was. I was a lord of my own island. <laughs> Give that up. <laughs> Beautiful island, a lot of trees. But like you said before, the main gift that she gets, the most important gift she gets, is three petrified dragon eggs from Illyrio Mopatis. Daenerys' wedding night is, you know, I, she's a virgin going into it, and I guess she has a pretty painful night uh, with Khal Drogo, and she is not enjoying her marriage at first. And I'd say, what is it, like episode three, episode four, where she things start to get better for her. Mm-hmm. With Cal Drogo. Mm-hmm. And she kind of, I guess she leans into the punch a little bit, you know, embraces her situation and things get better for her. But as they get better for her, you know, as they're all journeying to Vase Dothrak, they get worse for Viserys. Yeah. He starts getting more and more impatient. Oh, he's no patience. Daddy! Daddy! Get- <laughs> Daddy! <laughs> Daddy! <laughs> and then it gets worse for him because he sees the Dothraki accepting Daenerys as their Khaleesi. Right. And more and more and more and more, they're like, you know, forgetting about him, like, all right, who's this well, guy? Yeah, it, none of them, it, nobody cares who he is. Yeah. You know? Like, Illyrio Mopatis has been pumping up, pumping him up as the real king of Westeros. He thinks he's the real king of Westeros. He has his sister living in fear of him. And Daenerys' wedding, uh-huh. there's a exiled Westerosi knight who pledges Viserys his sword. But then on the road to Vaes Dothrak, he realizes... Nobody cares who he is. He's got no power whatsoever. But here's Danny with some power because she's the Khaleesi. I, I like that line. I'm not sure what exactly episode it is. And she's like, uh, the next time you lay hands on me, it will be the last time you have hands. Mm-hmm. As she accepts the Dothraki culture, which she kind of has to do. It's like Viserys, he gets jealous and he also, like he attacks her for it. And it's like, yo, dude, like this is what you wanted. Yeah. You know, and now you're like jealous and angry at me. Like, what do you, like, what do you, what is it you expect me to do? And what is it, what, what does she do when he, he like the first time he loses his shit with her? Like she gave an order to stop or. Well, you talk about that, that scene that was outside. Yeah. It was like on on the, she's, I think she basically told him like, you know, you do it again. I think she told, did she tell him like. Well, he can't, he comes in bugging out on her because like they had to stop because she was uncomfortable or she wanted, she had to pee or something. So they told the Kalasar to stop. So he comes running up like, you don't, you don't give me commands. You don't tell me to stop. And she's like, what, like, what are you talking about? Like I had to pee or whatever. He goes at her physically and one of her blood riders gets him with the whip, right? Yeah. And then it's, it's pretty much all downhill from there for Viserys Targaryen. He gets drunk and he tries to steal the dragon eggs and Sir Jorah doesn't let him. I see the way you're looking at my younger sister. Don't think I don't know what you want. 
And Sir George's like, yeah, I yeah. <laughs> I'll admit it. I should be okay as long as I don't fall into that friend zone. He doesn't get the dragon eggs, so he makes the biggest no-no, which is he enters. Um, oh, man. Faze Dothrak with a weapon, and he. Is he also drunk now at this time, too? Oh, he's, 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 he's hammered. He's yeah, ten he's sheets hammered. to the wind. Yeah, he's, he's just, he's a man lost to sea without a lifeboat. And then he, he says, he, well, he, he, he tells Khal Drogo that he demands that he helps him invade Westeros mm-hmm. or he's taking Daenerys back, but he'll cut out the baby. Yeah. That Daenerys is now pregnant with. Uh, that was like the. I believe that. Yeah, that was, uh, oof. Uh, yeah, that's. <laughs> and it's kind of. It, well, what a way of act- words. <laughs> it's great acting and it's kind of sad because Khal Drogo says, okay, I'll give you what you want. Crown for king. Huh, that's what I wanted. That's what I've been and, wanted. Yeah, Daenerys <laughs> translated translates that, and for a second, Viserys is like, "All right, finally, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get what I want." Like for a second, he like thinks that, like, "All right, it's all good," but it's not all good. He gets a crown for king, but it's uh, molten gold dumped on his head. Who died first, Viserys or? Okay, I don't know why I can't remember any names tonight. Sir Roderick's son, Jory. Jory. Oh God, thank God, uh, Viserys. Essentially, Viserys Targaryen is the first major death. I wouldn't even call Jory a major death, though. No, but I was trying to think of... The name. Yeah, or characters that have been around for a few episodes. But yeah, Viserys is the first major death in Game of Thrones. What a death it was. A crown for king. It's not how I want to go out, huh? No. And Daenerys says... She doesn't even shed a tear. She says, he was no dragon. Fire can't kill a dragon. Which is true, but it can kill a Targaryen because Targaryens are not actual dragons. And I think Benioff and Weiss struggle with that. Daenerys, Jorah, and uh, I guess just some of the handmaidens and her, I think they're called Kos, not Blood Riders, K H O S, Kos. Those are like her bridesmaids. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, like her bodyguards. <laughs> I don't know if they leave Base Dothrak. I'm not sure of the layout, but they go out to like a trading town. Sir Jorah is, he makes up some excuse to, leave her side for a moment and he gets into some, it's revealed that he's into some bad business. He's playing both sides Mm -hmm. and we get the assassination attempt on Daenerys. And this is the assassination Uh, ordered by Robert. Right. Uh, On a quick side note, that guy who, who tried the assassination attempt, he always reminded me of the, uh, Rost from the night's watch. They almost like resembled each other. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do, actually. I mean, it's obviously not the same actor, but they're, they're very similar. <laughs> we were short on money, so we had to use the same, two, the same actors with different roles. Who are we going to use? Ross. <laughs> Get Ross in here Get right Ross. now. Who's on standby today? <laughs> Ross, not tomorrow. <laughs> She'll play every whore we have. <laughs> <laughs> So is this assassination attempt before or after Danny eats the heart? I think it's Ooh, after, right? Uh, I think it's after because I think Viserys is still around when when she eats the heart. Jesus so, Christ, I don't know. What was that the heart of again? Was it it was a stallion or uh Yeah, something like gross test like that. It was one big it was one big like I don't know, I forgot what um uh, candy or something. Some like Oh Which, yeah, for for, yeah. for Amelia Clark, yeah. Yeah. But it's just a raw horse heart. <laughs> and the idea is when the Khaleesi is pregnant, she has to eat this heart, and if she keeps it down, the baby will be, I guess, a boy and a strong cow. And she gets it down. And Drogo's super, super proud of her. All the Dothraki, you know, are are, are chanting for her. And that's where Viserys realizes, you know, it, this is not gonna work out the way he wanted to. The stallion who mounts the world. That's what the, I guess the Dash Kaleen say that her baby will be the stallion mm-hmm. who mounts the world, who takes over the entire world. And it's. When they a, see banners, well, the book, this is book, and they see banners of a flaming stallion. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of similar sounding to the prince that was promised, the stallion that mounts the world. In one case, the prince that was promised is saving the world. The stallion that mounts the world is conquering the world, but looked at it from the point of view of each of the cultures that this prophecy came from, they're probably a very similar prophetic figure. But ultimately, 
Daenerys, Daenerys does not give birth to the stallion who mounts the world. Because along so, the way... <laughs> well, so after the assassination attempt, Drogo vows... Yes, few words, right, right. Jorah saves the day, which is kind of BS because he knew there was an assassination attempt taking place. Yeah. And in that moment, Jorah chose one side. But that doesn't, you know, in the long run, that doesn't... Help him. <laughs> it, no, it doesn't help his situation. Maybe he can sleep better at night, but it was exiled from Daenerys. So after the assassination attempt, Cal Drogo vows to win the Iron Throne for Daenerys. And in order to do that, they need to conquer some lands, capture some peoples, sell them as slaves to get the capital to cross the Narrow Sea. And Daenerys doesn't like this path to taking Westeros because she identifies with the people they're taking as slaves. She saves one woman in particular named Miriam Azdur, mm-hmm. who acts like she's very thankful for Daenerys saving her. How does Drogo get injured in Game of Thrones? Um, he takes a blade to the left shoulder, to the left upper chest, which I think is different than in the books. Yeah, it is different than in the books. Um, in the books, they're fighting another Kalasar, uh, and he killed... He kills the cow and the cow's son, but one of them, like, cut off his, I think, like, his nipple gets cut off or something. In Game of Thrones, I think it's one of his lieutenants gets angry with Cal Drogo because Daenerys came to him and said, I don't want us mm-hmm. taking slaves. Cal Drogo says, that's the way of war. We have to, but you can keep the women that you freed. And then his lieutenant, like, bugs out at this, and it's not the Dothraki way. You're letting her change you or whatever. And... uh I guess he challenges Drogo. Drogo makes short work of him, but he does get injured. Mm-hmm. And Miriam Azdur makes all these promises. Well, she first she says she can heal him, and yeah, uh, you know, he really has to. He has to have the wound dressed, otherwise, you know, he it may be infected and he'll get sick and die. And Daenerys buys into this hook, hook, line, and sinker. Yeah, House Tully. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She catlined herself. I guess what she wrapped the wound in was poison. But it made the wound worse. Drogo gets worse and worse and worse, and it culminates with him falling off his horse, which mm-hmm. is a huge no-no for cows. You can't mm-hmm. fall off your horse. If you fall off your horse, if you can't ride, you can't lead. But then Ares tries to cover for the fact that he can't ride. She falls for Miri Maz- Mazdur again. And she's right. like, he, he must have not worn it right, or, or he must not have you know changed the dressing. Yeah. Now, 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 now we got to kill a horse. Yeah, well, yeah, because Danny's like, well, can you can you save him? She's like, I can save him, but you know, it'd be using blood magic, you know, but I can't save him. Yeah, they have to sacrifice a horse, but at the same time, as this blood magic is going down, his other lieutenants start leaving. Yeah, well, they they they've had enough of Daenerys and Miriam as door, and they want to. I guess they want to kill Daenerys, but Jorah mm-hmm. steps in. Of, yeah, he fights one of them off, but. Somehow, during the scuffle, Daenerys falls, and she goes into labor. And Jorah doesn't know what what to do. You know, he's never had to deliver deliver a baby, so he does like the worst thing possible. Yeah, is, inadvertently. <laughs> yeah, he basically kills the baby. But it's, it's still a total boner of a move. You know, he brings a a, a woman going into labor into a blood magic ritual. <laughs> you know, I, I gotta be honest. I did for the longest time. I did not even really catch that. Really, yeah, I never really. Totally caught that time. One time I watched it, and I said, wait a minute. He inadvertently kills the baby. Yeah. Now, let me put, let's just bring in this hutch. What could go wrong? I mean, <laughs> there's she's, some, kind, she's kind of a doctor, right? Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's somebody in there screaming all, all kinds of uh, foreign languages and tongues and whatnot. What could go wrong? It's pitch black and, you know. It's a, there's a dead horse on the ground bleeding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I forget about the sanitary issues here, Jorah. <laughs> but he just has no idea. He has no idea what to do, so he's bugging out. He's like, uh, uh, uh. So we get a blackout. Daenerys comes to. Her baby's dead. Jorah has to tell her. He gives her the news that the, <laughs> the baby's dead, but it never really lived. And it was a monstrous thing. And Miri Mazdor chimes in here, happily telling her that the baby was born with scales and a tail and, you know, deformed wings. I mean, Jorah kind of confirms this. I mean, what do you think? You think it was, you think it was bullshit? You think Jorah was just seeing things? Uh, I don't know. 
Yeah, I don't know either. It, 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 it seems a little too, I don't know, too sci-fi horror. Yeah. For Jorah sure to do that. But then again, this is the first, this is, you know. This is well, this is where we start to, to see some magic in, mm-hmm. you know, in the story. All right, her baby's dead. Now she demands to see Khal Drogo because she realizes that it wasn't the horse. It wasn't the horse's life for Drogo. It was it's the, the baby's, baby's life. life. Right. Sure enough, Drogo is alive, but he's in a coma. He's catatonic. <laughs> Do we get the line about when will he return to me? When will he come back as himself? Do we get that in the TV show? I think we get – I can't – You know, when the mountains crumble to dust, when the sun rises. You don't get, I don't think we get the full – I think we get something. It might, it might not even have been that big. We definitely do get something, though. Danny does repeat those lines. Not the full line of it, but she, but she does repeat that line. The gist of it, at least. You know, but it's a, what's really funny is like they set up, and George set up, these two characters that, you know, the first couple, you know, parts of the story, you thought were going to be constantly going at it in, in uh, Cal Drogo and the series. And... Within like a three episode time span, they're both dead. Yeah. yeah. It happens real fast. Yeah. Mary Mazdur says, when the sun rises in the west and sets in the east, when the seas go dry and mountains blow in the wind like leaves, when your womb quickens again and you bear a living child, then he will return and not before. And I think initially this is taken as Mary Mazdur saying, he ain't ever coming back. He's going to be like this forever. And I guess Daenerys understands it that way. Because she decides that she's going to mercy kill her her husband, which she does. And then she does a magic ritual of her own with Miri Mazdur, Khal Drogo's dead body, the three dragon eggs. Mm-hmm. And what's, what's very key here that people don't realize, I don't think, is Miri Mazdur is saying a prayer, a, uh, a spell maybe, if you will. While she's being burned. Yeah. That's with keeping Danny yeah. fireproof. Well, <laughs> at least in my eyes. I, I guess this one. Would, I mean, is it a permanent spell? Because she's not there in season six. I don't think. Like, I don't think anybody's. No, well, but that's, like we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. Well, my question is, how does Daenerys even come up with this ritual? I don't even know. It's like she she knew what she was going to do. You know, as soon as she. As soon as she mercy killed Khal Drogo, she knew what she was going to do in this ritual. So the only thing I can think of is she's basing it off the blood magic that Miri Maz Dor was performing. But I don't know how one relates to the other. And I guess it's, you know, she burns Miri Maz Dor to death. Khal Drogo's already dead and the dragon eggs are petrified. She burns everything. And when all is said and done, you know, she walks into the fire, obviously. And when all is said and done, the two, Miri Maz door is, her body's burned, Khal Drogo's body's burned, and the three dragon eggs have hatched, and Daenerys hasn't burned for her. Did she walk in? I forget. Did she walk into it naked? Yes. Okay. I was going to say her clothes are burned, but she's good. I thought yeah. if, if, if there was any clothes, it was like very silky. Stuff that'll burn quick. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but Daenerys performs some magic and some dragons are born, and it's a great you know, climactic scene to season one, you know, especially after the horrible things that happened to Ned and Sansa and Arya, uh, you know, a couple episodes earlier or, or one episode earlier. I'm trying to see if we missed anything in season one. I think so. She doesn't, she doesn't name the dragons in episode 10. We learn their names in season two. Mm-hmm. And season two, the storyline basically takes part, uh, takes place in, in Karth, uh, which is a, I don't think it's not a slaver city, but it's a, it's a very wealthy city. And it's ruled by, it's ruled by a group called the Thirteen, and these are all, you know, merchant princes, rich, rich men who, you know, most of them make money with trading, and and I, I guess that it, that's it, because I don't, I don't think any of them are slavers per se. As we pick up with season two, the majority of the Kalasar that followed Drogo split on Danny. The ones that stuck around were. Her own co's, you know, her protectors, mm-hmm. her handmaidens, which are not called handmaidens. I forget what they're called. And, you know, like like the old, sick, orphan children, women, like the worst, the non-fighters of the Kalasar. They stuck around with Danny, the malice to feed, so to speak. But she promises to take care of them. And 
Jorah sticks with her, although he keeps mentioning maybe they should go to uh, Ashai. Does he say that in the TV show? Yeah. That they should he, always, he always mentions that. He always like, we should go to Ashai. It's like, shut up about Ashai, Jorah. Well, I'm just saying. It'd be fun. But they cross the Red Waste and really struggle, and a lot more of them die. One of her co's dies. Drogo's, uh, the, the horse that Drogo gave her, the horse dies. Finally, they, they, they make it across the Red Waste. They come to the city of Karth. The ruling council, the 13, they don't want to let her in. But one member says he'll take responsibility for them. Zarozo and Doxus. I get, I get so confused now. Oh, uh, yeah. I, the well, the next couple of seasons, I just, I just, I can't, I, I cannot keep up with the names. Well, it's hard enough to keep up with the Westeros storyline. You know, you can right. miss all this stuff in Essos. It's like, you know, ultimately it doesn't matter any of it. But Zarazo and Doxus, just a member of Karth's ruling council, the 13, he takes responsibility for them. And it's pretty dull season two for Daenerys. You know, they go to some fancy parties. She sees the warlock Pyat Pri, who's pretty creepy looking, and he says uh, she should come visit him at the at his temple, the House of the Undying. And she's like, yeah, whatever. But then she discovers that her dragons are missing, and Pyat Pri has them at his temple, the House of the Undying. So Daenerys, Jorah, and I forget which of her co's, I don't know what the guy's name is, but they go to the House of the Undying to get the dragons back. Mm-hmm. And, uh... So Jorah not doing such a hot job as uh That's her first, you know, the uh, Lord Commander of her Queen's Guard because he loses track of her real quick. So she enters the temple alone. This had to be tricky for Benioff and Weiss because we know in the books, in the temple, she gets some very specific visions, which are described by Martin in a way to make them vague and mysterious. But you're not going to get that on TV. You're going to see what you see. So what did you think of the substitutions for what she saw? In the House of the Undying. And, I mean, if you remember it pretty well, walk us through. Well, the only thing uh, we really do see is Danny going into the throne room. And we see the top of it's all collapsed, burned away. Whether well, that's from speculation. Is it, is it been just because of waste, because of war, dragon fire, uh, wildfire maybe. The throne room is covered in snow. It's snowing out. That means winter has come. And you think it's, defi- it's definitely snow and it's, it's not possible that it's like ash, right? I think it's snow. Um, Stanley goes up to the throne room, the empty throne room seat. She goes to reach and then she pulls away because she hears a scream. Now, as we've said many a times on our podcast, one of the swords that are, that is there is being purposely oh, right. kept covered in snow is Longclaw. So, you know, that's just another... I, I it, <laughs> What is that sword doing there? I mean, we'll we'll talk more about that, maybe. Well, yeah, but I mean, also it's the other parts of it, like there's the I snow guess, falling on the throne room. Is, does that yeah. you know? I mean, Jon Snow. Does it mean the White Walkers? I mean, there's a little bit of both. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. It's got that double meaning. And then how about the the damage to the throne room? You know, is it dragons? Like you said, I think at the time I assumed it was her dragons. You know, her having. Mm-hmm. Conquered King's Landing, or that's what it was supposed to signify, but it's also now, possible that it's... That was a Viserion. Mm-hmm. Do you think we get that shot in Season 8? Yes. Sweet. I'm we'll get some. It. We'll get stuff that's, that's going to be like, oh, shit, there it is. But then you know, she hears that scream, and then she goes out to this wall, and then there's the gateway to the north, to the wall. Right. And then right. when she goes in and she sees Khal Drogo again with it, with her uh, unborn son. So do you think, I mean, her going through the wall had some significance because... Her fate had to lead to the wall. Mm-hmm. And then the final spot she goes is into this tent where mm-hmm. Khal Drogo and Rago, her unborn son, the stallion that would mount the world. Mm-hmm. They're just chilling and it's a happy life. And she's and, happy. And that. this is kind of where I think she says... If I'm not mistaken, you know, when there's when the mountains blow and moon, oh, right. this right. is when she says it. When the sun rises in the west mm-hmm. and sets in the east, when yeah. the seas go dry, yeah, yeah. Danny says it here. So, I, I mean, looking looking at all three of these things together, what kind of significance do we have? She's been to the wall. 
her son was never born. So that that is like a future that can never happen. She's been to the wall. We think that we're going to get a shot of the throne room the way it's seen in this vision that she has. But more than likely, she will have a child born to her who has a son who's at the wall. Maybe that's the connection. Okay. I mean, do you think there is a connection? Because it's these are these are none of these things were in the source material. But like we said, they can they can use the source material. Uh, you know, they can cast somebody as Rhaegar and Ilya, and you know, like the or uh, yeah, it was Ilya, right? It wasn't Lyanna in the book? Uh, the House George George has said it was uh, Elia. Yeah, unless George is lying, but I don't think he's lying there. Honestly, I don't, I don't even think he can keep up with all of his stuff he wrote. So. I wouldn't, he wouldn't be a trusted source. I think anything, anything Elio says on the matters, you know, that's the definitive, definitive voice on Martin's work at this point. But they couldn't do all those things. So they, they chose to do these three mini segments and not all, they're not uniform in that they're all things that will happen because obviously Drogo and Rago, that's not something that's going to happen. So is there significance in that? Do you think? Repeat the question again because I just want to make sure I'm answering it. Well, basically what I'm saying is, like you can, th- like she goes into the throne room and it mm-hmm. is destroyed mm-hmm. with snow falling. So that has some. There's double meaning there, and it's also something that can very likely uh, it can very likely be a scene we see in season eight. She right. passes through the wall. She's been to the wall in season seven. She never, you know, walked through the entrance to um, Castle Black or wherever it's right. supposed to be. She, she never did that, but she's been to the wall. And chances are she's not going back to the wall in season eight, but she's been to the wall in season seven. And then the tent with Drogo, who is dead, and Rago, who was never born. Like those were the three segments that Benny Weiss chose mm-hmm. to show us. So I'm, I guess what I'm asking is, do you think there's any significance, not just like the double meaning of the throne room, but the fact that she had one possible future that can't happen one possible future that we know happened in season seven, her going to the wall, and then the throne room, which could still happen. I mean, I'm sure this is, I can't, I don't know what it's going to be until we see it, you know, like, I yeah. don't know. The only thing I really think of it is all that together, the snow, the long claw, the wall, mm-hmm. there's got, there's a correlation with John. Um, now, where, where does that, where does that, 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 I don't know. Does she end up dying? That's how she's able to see, find Joe Rose that she dies. Hmm. It is possible that the two, you know, the throne room and the wall meant something. And Drogo was just like, you know, Momo was a fan favorite from season one. They just wanted mm-hmm. to get him back. <laughs> we need him. Yeah. Get Momoa. But she doesn't stay in a tent. I guess she hears the dragons cry again. For whatever reason. She knows it's not real. Mm-hmm. And she, she knows she can't stay there. And she finally finds her three little dragons. Then they're all chained up. And Pirate Pri comes in and does a, uh, you know, a mustache twirling villain routine. And he talks about how their power has grown stronger with the dragons around, right? Says that they're all going to stay there forever. And she gets out of it by, I guess she sees Drogon starting to breathe fire. And then they all start breathing fire. And she calls Dracarys and uh, Pirate Pri's burned to death. And uh, Danny's out. And we missed, uh, we didn't talk about that scene where Pyat Pri and Zarozo and Doxus kill the rest of the 13, but it really, it doesn't matter. It's just like total B, C storyline. But we end season two with Daenerys and she locks Zarozo and Doxus and one of her, I don't know, one of her chambermaids or whatever in a big vault. Yeah. And, <laughs> Locking uh, key is shut. <laughs> yeah. And I don't like. I, I know the girl betrayed her, but I don't really care, or I, I don't understand what what her reasoning was, or what she did exactly. And it's really not. It's not important. I guess the point for season two with Daenerys was becoming a stronger person. I'm not sure. Season two is is a weak one for Daenerys, especially after a strong season one. Well, even the book, she only has like four chapters in the, in the second book. Yeah, yeah, and maybe that was the problem is they were trying to stretch that out into a season long story arc and uh, this wasn't the material just wasn't there. Season three, Daenerys travels to Astapor, which is a slave city located in Slaver's Bay. As she arrives, the warlocks of Karth attempt to assassinate her. They're pissed about the temple of the undying being burnt down. So they try to assassinate her again. And it was actually pretty creepy, right? Cause it wasn't like a, um, 
a little girl had the bug out eyes or something. Mm-hmm. And uh, what does she do? She gives her a, looks like she's given her a gift, but it's actually a manticore who goes to sting her. But da, 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 we get. <laughs> so embarrassed and silly. We get Jordan, Jordan Mormon's worst <laughs> nightmare shows up. Uh, he saves her. And last we saw Sir oh, Barristan. Love that scene. Love it. Last we saw Bar- Sir Barristan was episode 10, season one, where he. Storms off. Yeah. He's, he's given an early retirement package and he's like, he's like, Kingsguard don't retire. You know, Stick like, your right. package up your ass. Yeah. You take this job and shove it. Yeah. I like how he's like, even now at my age, I can still take all of these right now. Yeah. And I believe him, maybe with the exception of uh, Sandor. I mean, by the time he had to cut through like those six, seven guys, the Sandor came in, boom. I don't know. That'd be a little too much to handle, I think. I like, to, I like to think he could take Sandor like off the bat. Right. Like, if he went at Sandor first, maybe. <laughs> yeah, right. That's what I'm saying. If he went at first, he can get him, but like, if he's got to take down five, six guys and then have to go stand, you know, I don't, I don't know if that'd be, that might be a, too much uh, to ask for. Yeah. But Barrison's telling me he was Kingsguard to Danny's father, to the Mad King. And, uh, oh, Jorah's like, oh, God, I love it. Yeah. Danny's Danny. like, do you know, do you know this guy? I do. It's the finest knight in Seven Kingdoms. And a member of Robert Baratheon's King's God. <laughs> nudge, nudge. <laughs> <laughs> he also served Robert Baratheon, you know, <laughs> the guy that killed your brother. But Danny accepts him into her service after he saves her from the Manticore and explains why he's there to find her. I'm not sure what her plan is exactly, but she negotiates with uh, Krasny's Mo Naklaz. Uh, good luck. These names. What is the deal with these names? <laughs> why can't this can be like a Tim? Yeah, like Tim Smith. <laughs> the Astapor slave of Tim Smith. <laughs> Bill Anderson. You know? But she she negotiates to purchase an army of unsullied, who are elite eunuch soldiers. And she wants to buy all of the unsullied. And the reason she wants to do this is because she hears about how they're treated and, you know, how they have their balls cut off and they have to kill a puppy and all these different things. Terrific. Um, Krasny's translator, Missandei, translates everything Krasny says to Daenerys. And he's speaking Valyrian. And Danny acts like she can't understand Valyrian, but she does understand Valyrian. How she learned Valyrian, I'm not too sure. But she knows Valyrian. But she's <laughs> pretending like she doesn't know what he's saying. And I think in the show, a few times, he, he takes a swipe at her. And she has to act like, you know... She doesn't understand what he's saying when he's saying some real rude and uh, some very Harvey Weinstein-like comments. But she has to have all of the Unsullied, and she doesn't have enough money for it. But she offers up Drogon. Which Jorah's like, what are you doing? No, 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 no. Yeah, Barris and Selmy bugs out at this, too. Like, they're both like, what are you doing? <laughs> That's <laughs> The only reason you have any shot at taking Westeros is because of the dragon. You're going to give up a dragon for... You know, a bunch of soldiers with no balls. And she also asks for Miss Sandy, the translator. But Danny's had, Danny has a, has a plan and, uh, they complete the transaction and she gives the, uh, it's not, I mean, it's not a leash, but it's not quite a chain. But Drogon is, is on the end of, uh, you know, like a, I don't fucking know, mm-hmm. something tied around his neck that functions. Yeah. Like it's, uh, some sort of, uh, some some contraption, and uh, the masters are tugging on it, and they're like, uh, "He won't come off the, you know, he won't come out of the wagon. What's what's going on?" And she says, "Well, I don't know what she says. I think she says something like, like, well, that's because dragons aren't slaves. Dragons are free." And she says, "Dracarys," and Drogon starts burning the masters. Mm-hmm. You know, at the same time, she's let all the unsullied know that she owns them now. And she gives them the order to kill the masters. And yeah, they, I mean, it's, it's a real cool scene. I, I just love the way that uh, when she starts talking Valerian, he's like, oh, oh right. yeah, yeah. crap. Yeah, my recall of the scene is not doing it justice because it is, you know, these things have to happen in a certain order for it to be as effective as it is. And it, it is really effective. 
So she gets the Unsullied. She still has Drogon. We get Miss Sandy, who's super hot. And uh, yeah, this is like the best Daenerys Targaryen scene since the end of season one. But that's not the end of season three, because after taking Astapor and freeing its slaves and killing its masters, she wants to go to the next slave city, Yunkai. But Yunkai knows she's coming, so they hire the Sellswords, the Second Sons, to defend the city. And three of the commanders pay Daenerys a visit as she's marching on Yunkai. I don't recall much of the conversation when the three commanders meet with her, but then they have their own meeting, and two of the commanders order Dariona Harris to kill Daenerys. And he sneaks in while she's taking a bath, and he delivers her the heads of the commanders mm-hmm. and pledges his allegiance to her. And Jorah's like, oh, God. Yeah, he's like, oh, we can't trust him. She's like, what do you mean? He cut off the heads of the commanders. I think, I think the line is, uh, I think, I think uh, Dario says uh, something to the, to the effect of, uh, you're a very untrusting person. And he's like, only people who who are honest or don't tell are very untrusting. I, I don't know what the exact word is, but it was just like only don't. people like me. <laughs> <laughs> so then we get like the the three man sack of the city, right? Because Dario, Jorah, mm-hmm. and uh, Grey Worm have to sneak into Yunkai mm-hmm. and open the gates for the Targaryen army to take the city. And I, and I love how Jorah fights. I like I like how they've had Ian Glenn's fighting style. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. There's something about it. It's just very. I don't know. And Grey Worm was pretty impressive here with the spear. You know, I don't think he, at the time, I, I didn't think that he would go on to have as, I don't want to say a huge storyline, but pretty much have his storyline eclipse that of Sir Barristan. Um, oh, God. Yeah. We'll get to that. <sighs> um, but the three of them, I remember they fight off that one group, and it was a pretty tough battle, but they're like, all right, we did it. And then like three times the amount of men come running out. <laughs> then, when they finally, when they, when they uh, right, prevail, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jorah comes back in there and Danny's like, oh, like, you know, and like, and then like Jairo comes in and you just see like Jorah be like, yeah, he's alive too. <laughs> well, because he, he comes in and he's like all happy and proud. He's like, yeah. He's like, oh man, this is going to impress her. He's like, Daenerys, <laughs> yeah, the Khaleesi, the city is, the city is yours. And she's like, where's Dario? <laughs> and then Dario shows up and he's like, you know, my queen or whatever. And then you get that close up of Jura, which may have well have said, you know, may well have flashed on the screen. Friend zone. She frees all Yunkai's slaves and they hail her as Misa, which means mother. And that's season three. Much better than season two. A lot more to do. So season four, I, I I feel like that's like a another dip for Daenerys, right? Not a whole lot going on. Well, I'm in the, uh, meandering. What's that word we, we we like to use? Oh, meandering. Yeah, me meandering. There you go. Yeah, yeah. It's like season one's pretty good. Season two, meandering. Well, season three's we get pretty good. Season four is meandering. We get introduced to the brand new and uh, completely I'm not sure different. <laughs> not even close. Now you're you're a, you're a, you're a Dario one guy. I think so too, because I mean I understand you don't want to dye the hair and all how like how he dark, but at least like the hair was long and it, you can I don't know. There's just something about Dario number two that's just like I don't know. It looks like a great it reminds me of a Greyjoy more than Dario and Horus. Yeah, he's more. He looks more like a Westerosian than a yeah than someone yeah. from from Essos. Right. Um, I, I thought the first Dario at least had some sort of that you know Essos look mm-hmm. to him, or possibly look to him again. Obviously, they didn't dye his hair or anything, but yeah. And again, uh, real quick, uh, when they didn't dye his hair, it made people firmly believe that we will see Fagin in there because they didn't want to have two people with dyed hair. Okay. A lot of people were talking about that. Well, because, like, what's the other option? They just recast it and give them a different outfit and offer no explanation? They wouldn't do that. Yeah. But it turns out they did. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I guess they felt too. Ever the second Terry was a fair name. It's a better actor, maybe. I, I mean, I know, like, the reason the first guy didn't, uh, I don't know, but he 
his band or something, but then he was in freaking Deadpool. So it's like he's in Deadpool. He's, he's in he's he's been in a few movies. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I I I do think it was a scheduling thing with the first Dario. I do like the actor that played second Dario more than the actor that played first Dario. Now, who played a better better Dario? I don't know. They both had the Dario swagger and the confidence. I don't know. You know, I I, I always consider myself a second Dario guy. But that may just be because the first Dario didn't have enough time to shine. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Well, definitely. Obviously, you know, with just, just in season four alone, the second Dario had a lot more to do. Well, besides the new Dario, uh, Danny is marching on the last city in Slaver's Bay, Marine. And uh, they do this in the TV show where there's a, a – a dead slave nailed up pointing the way to yeah. the city. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a pretty, it's dark, but it's a pretty, pretty cool idea. Uh, so she decides to execute 163 Marinese masters as justice for the 163 slave children. Uh, they're all children uh, crucified on the road to Marine. After becoming aware that her council in Astapor, which she left to rule, has been overthrown and that Yunkai has gone back to slavery, Daenerys decides that she has to stay in Marine. And rule it. She can't just free the slaves and leave it be. And she wants to. It's a. It's a. It's two sided. She wants to make sure that Marine, being a slave, free city, is successful. And she also wants to see how good of a ruler she can be, before moving on to Westeros. She also begins a sexual relationship with Dario Naharis. How is it discovered? Uh, how is Jorah's, Jorah Mormon's betrayal discovered? Oh, God. Why not in the books? It's uh, Barristan, right? Well, Sir Barristan, yeah, he finds out. I, I think like a message is sent from, oh, you know what it, it, you know what it was? The, uh, the pardon, the royal pardon. They just, <laughs> I don't know, like, what did they use the mail? <laughs> like, <laughs> They used the early version of Westerosian FedEx and the courier brought it across the narrow sea to Jorah. <laughs> Jorah Mormont, care of Daenerys Targaryen, uh, at Marine. And then Barristan tell me, obviously, you know, breaking federal law by opening Jorah's mail. <laughs> uh, but it's the royal par- pardon. And Barristan, I think, goes to Sir Jorah first, right? Yeah. And he's like, well, you know, I'm going to tell Daenerys, like, you know, I'm just giving you a heads up. Um, you know, she can't trust you. I have to tell her. And does Jorah, does Jorah kind of like plead for him not to tell her? I'm getting the book and the show version of it confused, but long story yeah. short, Daenerys finds out that Jorah had been working both sides early on and she was very disheartened to discover how late it was that Jorah had stopped taking you know, had stopped playing both sides and she had trusted him this whole time. She doesn't want to kill him. So she exiles him from the city and Jorah rides off a broken man. And the only other thing that happens season four with Daenerys is she finds out that Drogon has killed a farmer's child and she can't, like they can't capture Drogon, but they lock Mm -hmm. Rhaegal and Viserion in the category Isn't that season five? To keep people safe. And I think that's the last we see of Daenerys in season four. Put them in order for Daenerys, seasons one through four. Favorite to least favorite. Favorite to least. Um, favorite one. Interesting. All right. Uh, I want to say, oh, God. It's just tough. I mean, they're all, it's all very close, I think. Like two, three, and four are very close. I think I'd go one, three, four, two. Really? You think two's that low, huh? Two's pretty bad, dude. I mean, the House of the Undying is real good. Actually, maybe, maybe one, three, two, four. Because. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, because, I mean, both, you know, two and four are pretty bland. But at least two has the house of the undying. Like I feel like there's no major. And four, 
I don't want to say it's a repeat of, of, of season three for her. I mean, it's not, but it, it's not, but it is, you know, it continues it's not, it, it so closely. Like, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, season one is far and away just because her character goes through a complete arc. And then even after going through that arc, she, you know, she, she thinks she is in control of things and Cal Drogo dies and she finds out that she's not. And, uh, she was too trusting. And then that scene with the dragons is one of the most, if not the most iconic scenes throughout the series. Uh, definitely of season one, you know, that and, and Ned being beheaded. Those are the, the two, you know, those are the two big scenes of season one. And, uh, yeah, one, one, it's, it's like one is like head and shoulders above everything else. It's almost like the character of Daenerys is really just built around what she does in season one. Because nothing else she does comes close to it, I don't think. At least not in the first four seasons. But moving on to season five, she's made the decision to rule Marine, get things under control, be a proper queen, a queen for the people. But there's a new threat. The Sons of the Harpy. This is uh, they're like a resistant movement, not made up of former masters, but definitely funded by former masters and uh, likely funded by the masters that now rule Yunkai and Astapor. Oh, I forgot about this scene where she executes uh, one of her counselors um, who was a, he's a freedman, which is the new name for the slaves. Well, the former slaves, they're called freedmen now. And one of them is her counselors, and he kills a captive son of the harpy. I forget why he did this, but I imagine it's this situation is a lot like the Rob Stark, Ricard Karstark situation with the uh, with the Lannister nephews. Mm-hmm. So here she has a freedman who killed a former master. Who I think it was something along the lines of that former master had killed his wife, or something along those lines. And Daenerys has to make a tough moral judgment. And she decides to execute the freedman, the counselor, for killing a captive son of the harpy. And by doing this, her popularity with the former slaves, it doesn't quite plummet, but it drops a great deal. And then the great Sir Barristan the Bold, Sir Barristan Selmy, former Lord Commander of the King's Guard to two different kings, Member of the King's Guard, I think, for three different kings. Yeah, three. Yep. Goes into battle without a helmet and, uh, well, without any armor whatsoever, I think. Saves Grey Worm, but he's killed in a dirty friggin' back alley of Marine, unceremoniously. I don't hate it. I don't hate it. At least he had, like, a, a hero moment before he we went out. In that regard, yes, but I think I kind of hate it. <laughs> yeah. But this is now, you know, it's season five. I do believe that Benioff and Weiss went on record. I think it was season five where they said, you know, probably do seven seasons. You know, I see like 70 episodes and, and we'll have this story told. Paraphrasing, obviously, but mm-hmm. I think they went on record with that season five. So with that in mind, yeah, you got to start kind of, I don't want to say cutting the fat because that's not what Sir Barristan tell me is to me. But unfortunately in Game of Thrones, he does fall more to the side of, House Dorn, you know, I'm sure there's another example. Oh, the Dire Wolves, you know, just yeah, things that are key in the book. Uh, yeah. They always see the book. Oh, sorry. Yeah. But yeah, at the very least, he got that hero moment with the uh, Daenerys Targaryen theme music playing. And, but he did. The music was awesome at that time. He just, yeah. yeah. Although you knew he was dead, right? As soon as he showed yeah. up, you knew he was dead. Because at the, de- at the end of the day, you can't take the Sons of the Harpy seriously unless they are able to raise the stakes by killing a character that we, that we, me and you really like. And, you mm-hmm. know, the regular audience probably just recognize or kind of like. So Marines in upheaval and Danny comes to the conclusion. And it's, it's, she comes to this decision, I think, in the show, mostly because, uh, his Darzo Lorak keeps trying to convince her to reopen Marines fighting pits. And she doesn't want to do this because the fighting pits are basically 
slave versus slave fighting to the death for like a cheering audience. And she thinks it's barbaric and, you know, uh, it, it goes against everything that she's been working to accomplish in Marine mm-hmm. and Yonkai and Astapor. But as it turns out, all of the, I, I think this is the case in the TV show. Honestly, I'm just going off the books. Most of the fighters that she talks to would rather fight than not fight. And they don't feel like it's something they're being forced to do. They actually enjoy it a lot. They live for it. Was that the case in the TV show? I don't know. I, I, Ultimately, I, it doesn't always, matter. <laughs> yeah, I, I always felt it was just kind of, um, I don't know. I think they could have done a better job Yeah, there with, uh, yeah. Like, you know, just hell, I mean, at that point, even making, do do even more of a D&D original joint or something. Yeah. Of giving them, a, you know, really make something up. Like, oh, this is, this is what we would feel Danny would have done and why. You know, the, you know what they, they really could have done is I'd like that they kept so close to, well, not so, real close to uh, Game of Thrones in season one, pretty close. And I'm talking overall, pretty close to a Clash of Kings in season two, and then pretty close to splitting up a Storm of Swords, you know, not right down the middle, but at a good, you know, climactic, uh, dramatic climax in season three and then season four. I like that they did that. But I think with Danny, since she is such an important character, and since she has so little to do in season in A Clash of Kings, and since her storyline is so unnecessary and complicated in Essos, they could have just banged out all her season two stuff in like, I don't know, two episodes in season two. Started the season three stuff. She meets Dario one in season two, you know, starts taking the slaver cities and have her. I mean, she could reach Marine by the end of season two. And then all of this stuff in Marine that they try to like squeeze into, you know, a few episodes. Yeah, that would been far too extreme. No, I think they, I don't think they would even think well, to do that. No, no, obviously not. But I, I just feel like, and I, I think this is the case in the book also. She makes the decision to rule Marine at the end of the Storm of Swords. She's not in a Feast for Crows. So we get her ruling for the duration of a Dance with Dragons. You know, Jon Snow's only Lord Commander for the duration of a Dance with Dragons. And it's like, I don't feel like that was enough time for them to learn how to be a ruler and a Lord Commander. Mm-hmm. It's, I, I just feel like it's too much squeezed into one part of the story, TV show and book. And even them trying to dumb it down, I mean, that may be a bad word for it, but them trying to, you know, cut the fat with the, with the Marinese storyline. It's like, it's too much, too complicated. And it's, it, it just becomes something that's, tedious, mundane, and kind of boring at parts. But at the very least, season five for Daenerys ends with a... Well, you could be kind of, you have to, um, what episode does she meet Tyrion? The Gift. I think it's episode seven? Is it episode six? But yeah, Tyrion and Daenerys storylines finally converge. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was at the end of season four that Tyrion started his journey unknowingly to Daenerys at the beginning of season five. Varys convinces him to join Daenerys. Sir Jorah kidnaps him, you know, uh, thinks that's his way in with Daenerys, his way back in with Daenerys. Listen, I know, I know I gave away all this information to people that wanted to kill you, but I brought you the imp. It's like, oh, Jorah, you've proven yourself true. I'm just trying to, did she marry his daughter Zolorak before the tour of the fighting pits? I think she said she was going to. I don't think they officially married. Okay. You know, and that character, his daughter, his daughter Zolorak is, it's just, honestly, it's just the name and the fact that he marries Daenerys that is taken from the book. He's actually kind of framed as, as, as a good guy, right? Mm -hmm. But she decides she's going to marry him because that will, Make the Miranis happy if she marries. Right, 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 you know. right. And uh, she is close to deciding to reopen the fighting pits. He's taking her on, her on a tour of, I guess they're just like practice fighting pits to meet this to meet the fighters. And <laughs> at, the, at the same time, Jor kidnapped Tyrion, and then they were later kidnapped by uh, slavers who sold them to a group of pit fighters and. Uh, I think it was it was circumstance, right? It was just it was just dumb luck that Daenerys was there. Yeah, yeah. 
So Jorah, I mean, Jorah has to take advantage. Yeah, when Jorah, Jorah hears that the Queen's there, all of a sudden it's like, all right, hold on. He's like, oh, <laughs> Let me get that helmet. Let me get that sword. Let me get this. I'm fighting today. Oh, man. Put me in, coach. Um, so it's a gladiator demonstration, and Jorah takes off his helmet and reveals himself. And Daenerys is like, oh, man, this is so awkward. And then he's like, well, I brought you a gift. And Tyrion Lannis comes out, and he's like, I'm the gift. And Daenerys had to be super confused. Uh, what's going on here? What, what, what kind of gift is that fucking weirdo? It's a Lannister. That's kind of gift that is. It's a Lannister. But, well, like we talked about in the Tyrion episode, Tyrion convinces Daenerys to take him into her service. <laughs> and she says, all right, well, counsel me this. What should I do with Ser Jorah? I already exiled him, and, and here he is again. Go for it again. <laughs> Tyrion, Tyrion's like, well, you know, I should advise you to kill him, but <laughs> I would advise you to exile him again. And Jorah's like, bro, come on. I thought we were boys. So, like, so his plan fails. <laughs> <laughs> but it was on a whim he made it. it was a, you know, it was a shot in the dark. So, and what does Jorah do after, doesn't he like, does he sell himself back into slavery or what does he do exactly? He just joins pit fighters again? What does he do? Like he's, Where did he go after that? I feel like he went straight to back to the pit fighter guy. Yeah. 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 He does. And that guy's like, Seri- like seriously, like you, you were freed by the, by the queen of Marine. You want to, <laughs> you want to sell yourself back into my service. Okay, man. <laughs> I'll do anything for this queen. <laughs> hey, you crazy goddamn Westerosian wearing that friggin' bear Island outfit. here. Yeah. In the fucking desert. <laughs> 105 degrees. I'm not even sweating. I'm sir. I'm Lord Jorah Mormon. Damn it. Um, so finally the big day arrives, the opening of the reopening of Marinese fighting pits jam packed to the rafters. You cut the tension with the knife, your irre- irresistible force meeting the immovable object. Is Jorah the opening bout? I don't remember. Did they have like a bout? And no, I don't think that he's not the, I don't think he's the opening bout now. Oh, so it's Jorah Mormon's like upper mid card. <laughs> not quite like the undertaker spot, but he's like, uh, like a Jake, the snake. Yeah. From early days of WrestleMania, like that spot. Yeah, he's, he gets a good 15 minutes of, of time. Um, and it's pretty, uh, a, a pretty tight battle. A couple times, Jorah. Yeah, he's almost, uh, yeah. yeah. He's about to meet his un, untimely doom. Yeah. A guy who's down on his luck gets quite lucky here a few times. He, uh, he wins. He wins the battle. And Daenerys doesn't even know it's him. He figures he, like, what, what was his plan? Was he, do you think he, he, he he didn't know about the sons of the harpy. Like he didn't know that he could save her by coming back. I guess his plan was just to keep trying to fucking <laughs> win <laughs> win pit fights and revealing himself to be Jorah until she's finally like, All right, god damn it, fine. I'll let you back on my service. I just don't want to go see another fight where the winner ends up being you. He takes off his helmet, right? And she is surprised, and then he picks up the spear and he chucks it at her. And we talked about this in the Tyrion episode. For a second, I thought at least, he was throwing it at Daenerys. <laughs> Revenge. <Yeah. laughs> so you don't want me to take you don't want to take me back in your service, huh? But he's actually throwing it at a son of the harpy who is sneaking in to assassinate her. And this scene is so chaotic and so you know, the blocking, the directing. Great. It was great. And especially following, I think this followed the Hard Home episode, right? Or no, mm-hmm. no, no. Hard Home was eight. Stannis episode was nine. And then this is episode. No, this 10. is 10. Yeah. yeah, it was 10. Right, 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 right. But three blockbuster episodes in a row. Yeah. And this, I, I don't know. What do you think? Did, did you like the Dragon Pit or Hard Home? Which, which did you like better? No. Hard Home. But is it because of John or is it because, he, because you thought it was like the action was more intense and. Um, oh, the actress is more. It was just, you know, with the thing with the dragon it's it, it's kind of like it's kind of like legless, and right. uh, yeah, you know, he's got like fifty kills. And meanwhile, Gimli only has like fifteen. He's like, I had no pointing arrows, you know, assisting me. And it's like with yeah. Drogon there, it's like easy kill, you know. Like yeah. where John, it's, just, it's a little more intense, a little more um, personal. Yeah, like whenever Legolas, Legolas or Gimli show up, it's like, all right, like I'm not. Worried about either one of these guys at all? No, they're they're both fine. It's gonna be fine for them. 
I'm just going to keep killing bad guys. But yeah, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I loved it. Dario was great and uh, Grey Worm and Tyrion and Miss Ant- you know, they, were, they were so scared and, and what did Dario say? Surround your queen. I, dude, I, this, is, this is why I like Dario number two better. And maybe da- maybe Dario one would have done just as well in this scene. But I love Dario two in this scene. I think he's great. And that's what makes him my favorite Dario. But just when things are just when it looks like all is lost, Drogon shows up. He does get hit with a couple spears, but he, you know, burns all the sons of the harpy. And uh, Danny's cli- Danny climbs on his back, and they fly away. And then she's captured by a Kalazar. And then Drogon Drogon ditches her, right? Yeah, well, he's like he's recovering from the injuries, mm-hmm. so he's not really around. He's like, "Fuck you, bitch!" He's like, "I saved you already. Now you got to figure your own way out of this one." So yeah, I mean, season five is a little. Lucy goosey at first and uh, it finishes with a bang but then we get to season six which is really it's kind of the same as season five it starts off like oh my god and then it ends with yo it ends with some good stuff yeah there wasn't much at all that I liked about her second you know her return to Baze Dothrak not much at all is that because really because of the whole tire um the the uh, whole fire uh... that's like the capper, but another part of it is how she has this plan to take over the Kalasar, and it's so unrealistic. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I know it's necessary. You know, I know that I know she needed to have a Kalasar behind her, but you have to question like, well, what happened to the Kalasar that she had? You know what I mean? Like she had one. They were not very good, but they had, they had to have gotten better at everything Dothraki do. But they just like they just kind of disappear when the Unsullied come to the picture. You only pay for so many extras, I guess. Guys, we listen. We hit a wall. Yeah. We can't bring the extra fifty extras. We've already cut out as many dire wolves as we can. <laughs> we can't take a, we can't take money away from the north. We gotta take it from the south. Yeah. So look, we can only pay ten of you, and you're gonna only, you're each gonna have to play you're each gonna have to play like ten different parts. So one one of them realizes that she is she was married to Cal Drogo. She was Cal mm-hmm. Drogo's wife, now his widow. And they say, well, you got to, you know, as a widowed Khaleesi, it's your duty to live out the rest of your life with the Dash Kaleen in base Dothrak. And Daenerys is like, um, no, like I got, I have so much other stuff going on. That's not, it's not going to work for me. And uh, then she's told she's going to stand a sort of trial for defying Dothraki tradition Mm-hmm. And going out into the world following Caldrogo's death. During this Dothraki trial of sorts with all the Cals, Daenerys declares that only she has enough ambition to lead the Dothraki. All of them. So the outraged Cals threaten to gang rape her. I don't know why I'm laughing at that. Uh, they threaten to gang rape her, and Daenerys sets fire to the temple. Do you remember how she set fire to the temple? I don't remember how she set fire to the temple. She just like knocked something over, or yeah, it was like a little like uh, I don't even want to call it. Uh, well, from that ancient, from that day, yeah. from that day forward, the Dothraki had an official fire marshal <laughs> to make sure. Yeah, I think she like knocked something over, and it just everything worked out perfectly for her. You know what? You know why I don't like it? it? Like, it just feels like it wasn't very well thought out, and they used a, you know. Did they not want to use a dragon at that point? Yeah, like like if if Drogon saved her, all right, at least that's you know been status quo. But you know, it's like they used the Deus Ex Machina for her to be saved, and it was just, and it wasn't anything crazy. It was just she knocked down a candle or whatever, and and then we see that she's fireproof because she emerges from the fire unburnt, where everybody else was. So in the meantime, as all this is going on, Jora and Dario too had set out to find her. Mm-hmm. And along... Daring rescue mission. Yeah. Well, along the way, Dario notes notices that Jorah has uh, grayscale. grayscale. He's like, dude, you want to tell somebody that you have grayscale so they don't get grayscale? Um, and they don't really save her. They're just there when she gets out of the fire. Mm-hmm. And somehow... Like they, like they think that they're going to save her. Like, oh my God, this is going to be a great mission. Yeah. They're both like she's gonna she's gonna love me after this. Um, 
So yeah, I, they're waiting there as she emerges from the fire. I guess naked again, or and they use the body double or something. Mm-hmm. I would imagine he had a yeah. body double. Uh, Jorah's still looking. Yeah, Jorah's Jor totally looking. It's fact. We've seen it. We have proof. He bowed down before his queen, but he was looking. And then, does she see the grayscale or Jorah's like, oh, I got grayscale? Like, just, just, tell, just, just in case you should exile him again. He's like, wait, before you say anything. No, she was going to hug him and stuff. And then she was like, uh, Oh, you're going to hug me? I don't have grayscale. Yeah. Oh, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, so Daenerys does finally, well, she does kind of, he self exiles, is what it is. Yeah. She's like, I'm, then, but- she's like, I'm not going to exile you. And he's like, well, actually, I got grayscale, so I have to exile myself. Let's so say you come back to me with the cure. <laughs> while thinking all right i'll never see him again it's probably for the best you think you would have kept them around though for the battle well, she didn't know she was going to return to what she returned to a marine but if she had you would think she'd be like all right you know you go find a cure but first come help me fight off the slavers in marine but drogon dario daenerys and the dothraki four d's they return to marine and she f- returns to discover that Marine is under siege by the joint fleets of Yunkai, Astapor, and Volantis, another slaver city, but I do believe with the destruction of Valyria, Volantis is the oldest civilization in Slaver's Bay in that area. I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure. And all three of these cities have reneged on agreement on an agreement they had with Tyrion to free their slaves. And they're all trying, and they're trying to reclaim Marine and turn it back into a slaver city. And we talked about this with Tyrion. You know, uh, she's like, "What is going on? What have you done?" And she's about to, she's of the mindset to destroy everyone. And Tyrion kind of reins her in, destroy the navy, but don't kill everybody, which was pretty sound advice. Uh, I mean, what did you, what did you think of this battle? That was pretty sick. I thought, you know, it was funny because going into the to, to the episode, we all just thought it was just going to be uh, just about the bastards, but actually, it turned out uh, we were also going to get uh, the Battle of Marine. Yeah, and these are the two battles that George Martin has called the Battle of Ice, the Battle of Fire, which I think he wrote both battles and just decided to not include them in the Dance of Dragons. Mm-hmm. You know, figuring, well, I'll just publish them in a couple of years when I put out Winds <laughs> of Winter. Um, but yeah, interesting that they went that route because all the big battles, you know, previously have the entire episode has been dedicated to those battles. And here we get two, which are both clearly higher budget, both clearly, well, they're both visually more exciting. I don't know if they're as effective, at least definitely not the Battle of Slaver's Bay, but entertaining and exciting. And we get, Two of them in one episode. And I feel like this battle is pretty, pretty quick. You know, it's just Daenerys using the dragons and the slavers don't stand a chance. Oh, God. There's no cubitic man's music. Yeah. No chance. Yeah. That's what you got. Yeah, it's like the slavers had no plan for the dragons. Like, Yeah, like they had no idea. Like, <laughs> Oh, we forgot about the dragons, Ron. Nothing to see here. <laughs> we won't get harmed. That was episode nine. So episode 10 of season six, uh, Theon and Yara arrive at Marine and mm-hmm. willing to bend the knee to their, to the, to Daenerys and offer her the Iron Fleet. If Daenerys helps them rid the Iron Islands of their uncle Euron, crazy uncle Euron, mm-hmm. and, uh, help put Yara in place as queen of the Iron Islands, but a queen that will bend the knee to Queen Daenerys. And, uh, Daenerys agrees, but says no more, you know, no more salt lives, no more kidnapping, no more plundering, Mm -hmm. you know, it's got to be a new way. The old way on the Iron Islands is dead. Theon and Yara agree to this. And while this is going on, Varys has snuck across the narrow sea Mm -hmm. for a secret meeting with Ilaria Sand. Undetected, undetected, no one. For a secret meeting with Ilaria Sand and Alina Tyrell. And they both pledge their powers to Daenerys. And then Daenerys officially names Tyrion Lannister, Hand of the Queen. She's like, you did a really 
you did Horrible a really job. shit job with this one, but <laughs> but I like your I like your gumption. It's way called tough love. Yeah, I'll be honest with you, I've never seen a worse job in all my life. <laughs> something about you I like. <laughs> Tyrion's response was, "You thought that was bad? <laughs> you just wait and see." <laughs> I got plenty more bad decisions coming your way. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I won't make you regret this decision. <laughs> oh, you think you have a 200,000 army? Don't worry, I'll get those numbers <laughs> down to below 100 in no time. You see, my strategy is to make it even so that it's a better feeling <laughs> when we are finally victorious. Another question, though, concerning Varys. Where is he at in the minds of the of, of like Cersei and King's Landing at the moment? I don't quite remember... Yeah, that it's like here we've seen you speaking with them, we talk about him. Well, they, did, they had to have mentioned him in Season five, right? When maybe Quibran does, but that's it. Cersei's never like well, where's she had to have been like where's Varys? He must have been a part of this, and that was probably it, right? Yeah, and, 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 and if that was it, that was it. Wasn't anything else? So, second question: Was he? I don't think he was in the Dragon Pit meeting. <sighs> where would he? Where would he be? Uh... Jesus Christ, hold on. Let's see. I don't think he was there. And actually, it, it leads me to two more questions. What is What exactly is Varys' role in... Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. All right, let's see. I, I don't... Yes, he is there. And I feel like he doesn't even... Like, nobody even acknowledges him. Yeah, like, just didn't say, oh, where have you been? It's like, oh. <laughs> A little late for work, aren't you? It's just, it, I, mean, I guess it's just like, it's just accepted that, okay, well, he's been on the side all along of, uh. Well, these, these, these are my next questions then. What exactly is his, is his role in the, in the, in the, in the new Targaryen court? What is, what, like, what is his, is he the master of whispers for Daenerys, I guess? Well, I don't know. Because I think in the books it's he's, he, somewhat obvious that he's pulling strings to get Fagin on the board. Right. So then my last question is, and we should probably table it until we do our preview episode, but is he going to have a big role in the final episodes? Is he, at this point, excuse me, at face value? Or... I mean, at this point, if he betrays Danny, what's, he, what's the point at this point? Uh, well, there's got to be a point to him. Otherwise, I feel like they would have just, like, they would have killed him just to, you know, keep cutting dead weight. Well, remember, he is going to die in Westeros. Well, that's what Melisandre says. She also said that Stannis was the prince that was promised. Yeah, well, he's, Wherever she's getting her information. Uh, like, well, he's just a double usurper. <laughs> she mistook, she mistook uh, Stannis for, you know, for Jon Snow. And it turns out she mistook uh, Varys for some other fat, bald dude. Yeah, I don't know why it got me thinking that, but you know that scene when he when he he does get Olena Terrell and a, and uh, whatever the hell her name is, hilarious, uh, Ala- hilarious. Oh, yeah, yeah. When he convinces them to side with Daenerys, I mean, it doesn't really take all that much convincing. He hasn't done anything. So, like, what is his function beyond that? That was like the. The big thing he did. I don't know. We'll maybe we'll talk more on it. But one more, I guess, an observation. I would have really liked to see a final meeting between Peter Baelish and Varys. It's rather disappointing that we don't get it. Well, we still may get it. Oh, well, yeah. If he's, yeah, because he, he's probably still alive. Are you buying into that? Oh, dude, you're buying into that? What's that? The little finger's still alive. You said Varys, though. No, Varys is still alive, but I, no, I wanted to see a final scene between Varys and Littlefinger. Oh, I'm sorry. I was thinking um, Tyrion. I, I, oh. I, I was. I think you said Tyrion and Varys. I, so that's why you like. We, we may still get that. I was like, <laughs> oh man, he's talking about that stupid theory. Yeah, I guess that's not going to happen. I'm hoping it's not going to happen. Yeah, it would really suck if it is- happens. That would really suck. Do you imagine all of a sudden at the end where everyone dies and all of a sudden, you know, he just, oh, look at me. It takes a face off in a tent. It's me. Sits on the throne. Oh, God. Peter Baelish. It's me. 
<laughs> write an email to George. George, no wonder why you don't want to finish. No wonder why you can't finish the books. You just don't want to finish this garbage. Well, you know, it's the best ending I could come up with. No one expected it. Um. All right, Daenerys, season seven. Do we finish season six? Yeah, season seven. Riding on Dragonstone. Yep, I love the Dragonstone episode, but that's really all she does in Dragonstone is arrive. Mm-hmm. Had a great scene when she, well, she's that- walking through the castle and. You know, everybody's just kind of following her. Where do we begin? Yep. And then the episode ends. Like the first two, three episodes of season seven were so good, right on par with season six. And it, it, it kind of, not that it took a turn for the worse, but. Well, we, we, we got to uh, it. episode two, we have the uh, moment where Mel Sandra meets her. Right. Why don't you talk to that? Because I don't remember that meeting too much. She's just. Um, Melisandre says that uh, some of the king in the north, he is the prince that was promised. And that's when Melisandre says that we her, we know about prophecy also. And in Valyrian, there is no it's gender neutral. So this is the princess that, is prom- that was promised. And Melisandre says to that, she's like, uh, well, I do believe you do have a part to play. But so, but so does another. Jon Snow. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I guess that's when she summons Jon Snow to come down a drainstone and bend the knee. And Jon's just like, I just need some weapons. I'm only here for weapons. That's it. I'm going to take the weapons and, and leave. Remind me again how he gets involved. Because, like, she was okay with him mining Dragonstone for. Her. I, I think it was because of Tyrion. I think Tyrion was. Well, because Tyrion lost. The Martells and the Greyjoys, right? No, but I think Tyrion was talking to her that you know, well, you, give him a little, give him a little something, and he'll give back. But she, I might be wrong, but I like she was in a spot where she needed the North. Like John's, like, well, I'm, you know, I'm king of the North. My people won't accept that. You know, I, I, I don't want to fight with you, mm-hmm. but we have, this- yeah. Like she, and he's like, well, well, we're not here to fight your war. We're, we need to fight the real war. Mm-hmm. And then she's like, well, help me. When the Iron Throne, and I'll help you up in the north with your, with your zombies. The boogeyman, the boogeyman, it's the leprechaun. <laughs> uh, little does she know. Yeah, because if I remember correctly, John and company were just you know mining for what were they? What were they even doing? What were they looking for? Dragon glass. Oh, dragon glass. Right. Duh. Yeah, they were just searching around for dragon glass. Did they find much? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think they took a whole lot back. I mean, we'll find out in uh, season eight how much they got. Davos is like, there is absolutely no dragon glass here. And John's like, well, just find something that might pass as it so that we can say that we found some. So I think the straw that breaks the camel's back, the camel's back is the high, gor- the high garden casterly rock ordeal. We talked about this in Tyrion. Mm-hmm. He sends the Unsullied to Casterly Rock, thinking if he takes the Lannister seat of power, which, by the way, is the castle that he wants for himself, if he takes that, what, is, what does he think will happen? It'll just be like a moral defeat for Cersei, mm-hmm. I guess. It's just really... Uh, and maybe also try to pin, kind of maybe, if they take the western side of Westeros... They have the south. You kind of... You're kind of pinning mm-hmm. the land. They can't retreat. They can't come out. You know, mm-hmm. they won't be able to retreat out of King's Land and go to to uh, Cashier Lock. All right, fair enough. But I guess Jamie was thinking the same along the same lines, right? The Unsullied come upon Casterly Rock, and it is empty. So Daenerys loses her patience with Tyrion. Yeah, that's it. I'm tired of listening to you. She's like, you're a shitty, you're <coughs> a shitty hand. <coughs> Who the hell made you hand to the king? Hand to the queen. And she just, she's like, all right, Dothraki, follow me. She rides Drogon. It's just Drogon, right? Rhaegal and... Yeah, just Drogon, yep. yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they attack the Lannister caravan, carrying all the Highgarden wealth. Somehow, they leave enough of the Highgarden wealth for her to hire the Golden Company, but I guess Daenerys wasn't really worried about Cersei having a lot more capital to hire sell swords. I don't know, man. It seems like she's just as short-sighted as Tyrion. You know, if you're going to attack the, 
the the loot train take the loot. Yeah. It's war. <laughs> so, all right, well, we sent our message. Leave all the money. Yeah. They're going to need it. Well, they definitely do get it and need it and use it to their uh, full advantage. Do you, uh, I mean, uh, you know, we've talked this battle to death. Where do you rank this among the big Daenerys Targaryen set pieces, uh, action set pieces, or, you know, so again, talking about the birth of the dragons, the freeing of the slaves at, uh, in Astapor, the dragon pit scene, the burning of the cows in Bayes Dothrak, and then this scene. I think those are the five. Oh, like say we'll include the House of the Undying in there also. These six, you know, important big scenes. Also, the Battle of Battle of Ice. No, it's seven. Seven big Daenerys Targaryen scenes. Where do you rank this one? Are we, are we, are we including the you, the Battle of the Wall? Oh shit! So eight. All right, let's just do battles then. This is getting too confusing. So yeah, excluding the Birth of Dragons, excluding House of the Undying. So we're looking at. To me, it's one of the weaker ones. Me too. But people go nuts. I know like we are, best. and I know we are in the we are in the hipster minority in this one. Mm-hmm. We've become what we hate. Yeah, we are the hipsters. But if you think about like the Battle of Ice, you know that the the, the uh, Astapor, and uh, what was the other? oh the the Battle Beyond the Wall, and then this one, rank them one through four. Ah. Battle of the Walls 1, Dragon Pits 2, Lutrain's 3, the Astapor is 4. Wow. You put Lutrain above Astapor, huh? Yeah. I mean, it's a little more, it is more epic. Yeah. But just the, not quite jumping the shark, but just too many things happening that are like, eh, everything I know about this show, that wouldn't happen. It felt more like a Lord of the Rings battle in a few ways. It was visually exciting, though. You know? Like, they put a lot of effort into it. I get that. But, John, I... I, I Honestly, I think I might put Astaport number one. Really? Yeah. I think so. I think so. I think I might go Astapor. Astapor, Beyond the Wall. Um, Battle of Ice. Uh, Battle of Fire, rather. And then Lutrain Battle. I think that's my one through four. Either way, they have the Lutrain Battle... It uh, ends on a cliffhanger of Jamie sinking to the bottom of the river in his armor. And then, uh, yeah, then Cersei, uh, Cersei, Daenerys makes a decision to do something that is, I think, un- un-Daenerys-like, which is burn Randall and Dick and Tarly. Maybe I'm putting more emphasis on this than I should be, but I feel like she shouldn't have burned them alive and her choosing to do so gives her a little negative karma that is going to come mm-hmm. back and, and it's going to come back to haunt her. Maybe it could be one of the things that Tyrion thinks of. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because, you know, the bigger picture is her father was the Mad King who burned High Lords alive, right? Mm-hmm. Like if the Mad King, if Ares Targaryen had a dragon, that's exactly what he would have done. He probably would. He probably would have burned more people, but I forget. Was it wasn't just Randall and Dickon that were burned alive, right? Weren't? Uh, how did that break that down for me? She, were they offered the wall, or right? It was Randall, Dick, and Tarly, and then a bunch of Lannister and Tarly men captured. I think they were just offered. He want to join us until I think nobody was offered the wall. I thought they were offered. I don't think so. No. I mean, unless maybe uh, if Tyrion was there, maybe he thought that's where Tarly should go. Where her son was. Yeah. Like, you got to offer them the wall. She's like, well, what about the zombies? I was just, I believe in those anyways. <laughs> All right. And then we get the, the time jump episode uh, where John leads the expedition beyond the wall to capture White, which they will use to convince Cersei Lannister that the threat is real. The threat that she doesn't know about that they're about to tell her about. Daenerys saves them from an army of the dead. And yeah, there's just... You know, it's it's a great action packed episode, but just the the timing of it is just all over the place. Like we're talking, how how many days could they have possibly been out there? 
from the moment that Gendry started running south to the moment that Daenerys swoops it's gotta in. Be a, yeah, it's got to be a day or two. Like, is that enough time for Gendry to run to the south and then send a letter all the way to Dragonstone? I mean, I, 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 I guess it's possible for a dragon to, you know, go coast to coast, so to speak, in... I don't know, dude. Like, like, what is the speed of a dragon at... at I don't know. I feel like it's not... It's not possible. I feel like you need a third day, but they weren't out there that long. We need a third day, but we're just going to take the uh, rocket ship. Two days. Instead of the dragons. Two days to get there. Um, I don't know. I, I really don't think they need to really yeah. mattered so much on that because, yeah. I mean, if they wait out there a third day, I think those guys freeze to death. Yeah. It all had to happen, though, regardless. So, you know, you look the other way. And once you do, it's a real enjoyable episode. But Viserion is killed with an ice spear. And I don't know. You think this is the Night King just showboating a little bit? Just like you yeah. get the feeling that he was kind of toying with everybody. Like he was a little, mm-hmm. he was a little bit amused, even by the dragons. Yeah, I could do this. I could do that. I'm gonna go for the one right there. But I think this brings up a good valid point that something that the uh, alliance might have to consider is you know, Viserion got killed because no one was running him. Right. To do some evasive maneuvers if there was any kind of uh, weapon being thrown at them. What is the deal with the Night King? Like, it does feel like he was just toying with them. You know, like he was amused. Well, I guess... Like he, and you've, you've just, spoken before how perhaps they expected the dragons. Yeah. Right? Because what were their plan? Cause he could have easily attacked John for a like, right away. Mm-hmm. He knew the dragons were coming, so he was just going to wait. So what does that speak to? What does that tell us about him? He's in tune with the Werewood Network. Yeah, he's a green seer. Is it Bran? Is Bran the Night King? I don't know. I really hope not, but they could do a red herring by putting the Night King in a wooden wheelchair. And we really think it's Bran. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look. There's my wheelchair I used to always ride. And he's got like a really dumb uh, White Walker, like Hodor. <laughs> Stupid. Uh, all right, so Danny, it, to quote the classic American film "Bad Boys 2 for Daenerys Targaryen, shit just got real. Yeah, unless that's Bad Boys I mean, One, I don't remember, but yeah, I think it's finally real for her. And she's like, she says to John that you know I had to see it. You can't believe it until you see it. No, like literally, I didn't believe you at all. I thought you were. I thought you were like crazy or a coward, but now it- John makes a fatal move in <laughs> bending the knee. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, right. that'll be all taken care of next season. Yeah. Well, all right. So, I guess the last thing I kind of want to touch on is John and Danny. Is this a believable romance to you? Like, I don't know. What do you think? Well, I think even in the books, by the time we get to where they're going to be in the books. It's going to be happening kind of abruptly. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're five books in. They haven't even met. You're going to think it's going to take at least to the end of Winds of Winter for them to meet. You know, honestly, dude, I feel like it's going to take at least to the ends of to the end of Winds of Winter for her and Tyrion to meet. Right. So I can't criticize no the pacing no. of that relationship because I think it's just going to be as hard pressed in the books also. That's why I'm doing five more books. All set in Marine. <laughs> oh, I'm really going to get into the city's history. And I'll, I'm going to do four books. And then I'm going to do a history of Marine encyclopedia. And then the fifth Marine book. And then we'll move forward on the winds of winter. No, but what I'm saying is, I, I guess that is what I'm saying. Like, did I understand the time restraints, but do you think they did a convincing job of John and Daenerys falling in love. And from every aspect, the writing, acting, well, I guess just those, you know, the writing and the acting. Do you, do you think? And the uh, sex scene? And the sex scene. But Tyrion really takes away from the sex scene, you know, because it's just, it's super creepy. Yeah, like, what are you, what are you doing there, dude? It's, <laughs> he's betraying them. Like, you put Jorah there, it's like, all right, I mean, that makes sense. We get it. Makes sense. <laughs> Throws himself off. He throws himself off the boat. 
Like they, they close the door and like just like one tear goes down to his face. <laughs> and he's like, back to the drawing board. Back to the Jorah board. <laughs> God damn it, this guy took my sword, now he's taking my broad. <laughs> but I'll have the last laugh. And then also Jorah getting rid of the gate of the grayscale. I mean, I like that scene. You know, the pain that he went through to get rid of it. But there have been a lot of theories that Grayscale, uh, via John Connington, is going to really ravage Westeros. No way that's happening, right? In the books. At least based on Jorah's uh, bout with Grayscale. I don't... I mean, after a while, I mean, what are you going to have? You're going to have uh, an army of faceless men, an army of all wits and night and white walkers and an army of grayskull men i mean really where where does it end an army of wildings led by Rhaegar targaryen as man's raider yeah it's a lot of a lot of cool elements but a lot of them have to be cut and uh yeah the grayscale it's a cool idea it works real well with john connington because of you know it makes him rush everything along but i don't know that it it, it didn't really work too well with jorah i don't think i don't know so season seven Daenerys, is it a pretty solid season or are we meandering again? Uh, it's, it's a solid season. Yeah, you got to give it a solid season. You got to give it a solid season because finally she's part of the main storyline, you know? Mm-hmm. Like nobody – essentially she did six seasons worth of stuff that really didn't matter. You know, it was all about her character development. You know, at least like, like John's away from the main Westeros stuff while he's up at the wall. But the things he's dealing with there greatly play into the end game more than any other storylines. You know, Daenerys is similar because she's also away from the main action, but everything that happens where she is, is basically meaningless. Do you think the character of Daenerys Targaryen is a red herring? The way that she's framed as the hero, you know, uh, Aemon, Maester Aemon Targaryen says that she's the princess that was promised, you know. Well, I, I used to in that regard, but I, I'm not so much anymore because I feel as if that she's not a redhead, but she's got a role to play. The dragon has three heads. Uh, it's a, a big focus of the books. But it's, that's not a phrase mentioned too much in a TV show, right? Like, I feel like it has something to do. It's an important part of what happens in A Song of Ice and Fire. But I guess Benioff and Weiser, I mean, obviously, because there's only two dragons. So how can the dragon have three heads? Well, I'd be concerned. Night King is one part of the... You know, Night King's your ice dragon, Danny's your fire dragon, and John is the ice and fire. Do you think then... You're not saying that you think the Night King might be a Targaryen, right? That's not what you're saying. There's no, no. way. Well, all right, so any, any theories we save for another episode, but... Um, I don't know. You know, it, it's still even going through all this stuff. Daenerys Targaryen is not, it's not like she's not even like a character that I'm like rooting for. Um, I don't know if I'm expecting her to die. I do think she will, right? And, you know, we made our decisions a while ago about who's going to live, who's going to die. I do think Daenerys will die. I also think, you know, she will play an important part in the resolution of this story. But regardless, regardless of all that, having gone through everything she did during the TV show, I just, she's like a second thought to me. You know what I mean? She's like an afterthought. Like, I feel like I, I not that I know exactly what's going to happen to her, but I know what her fate is in broad strokes. I think we've both been expecting it for a couple seasons now. And of all the things that have to, that will happen in the final six episodes, what Daenerys does is, not very, I'm not very interested in it. Definitely not excited for it. Really? Yeah, I'm, j- I'm just not. Oh, you're, I'm, I'm pretty excited right now. I, I mean. Well, I mean, just, I'm just still like Daenerys. Like, yeah, it'll be cool when she shows up at Winterfell and, you know, John finds out he's a Targaryen, but she feels like, it feels like she joined the John storyline more than it feels like John joined the Daenerys storyline. Like it feels like she is, I don't want to say second fiddle, but she is now a supporting character to Jon Snow's journey. 
I guess that's the best way I can put it. You know, she was given all this importance over the first six seasons. And I guess you can conclude the seventh season also, but I don't feel that going into season eight, like I don't, I don't, I don't think she's going to sit the Iron Throne. I don't think that she's going to live. I don't think that maybe she'll give birth to a baby, but it just feels like she's been set up as a red herring for who the hero of this story is from day one, because she's really the only character who's had a, uh, like a, like a straight through narrative of, you know, growing, learning, uh, having a defeat, bouncing back, overcoming odds. And she finally gets to Westeros. It almost like it feels like it almost feels like her story is, is done. And now it's just, going to be the repercussions of her journey. But her journey is finished. You know, she became a queen of marine. She learned to rule. She came to Westeros to take her, you know, to take the Iron Throne, but things are not what she expected them to be at all. And they're a lot worse. Her sitting the Iron Throne is not, is not a priority going into the last season, right? Because it's, it's the others and the Battle for the Dawn part two. That's the concern. That's the main conflict. And it feels now that she's she's an afterthought. You know, there'll be revelations, but not to her. It's revelations about John. There's no mystery surrounding her, really. You know, it's all surrounding John. I don't know. What are you? What are your thoughts on Daenerys? Oh, I dis I disagree on her level of porn. She's going to do something very important. It's no, I, I think she will too. But it's just all I'm saying is like I'm just not of all the things that I'm interested in. Excited for, I I can't like I can't put Daenerys in in that list. Like I feel like I can make a list of ten to twenty points, and it wouldn't include what happens to, what happens to Daenerys. What do you what have you thought of her journey so far, though? Going through all this, she has well, she has handled some defeats, but I I feel as if her she started off at the bottom. She's had some rough roads, but she quickly rose. Because of the dragons and all that went theater. So her character wrote risen for, has risen for that, you mm-hmm. know. It's almost like she, it, it feels like she's, like she has a lot of plot armor. Like she's been, I've never felt she was in danger. Right. You know, and, and Jon Snow, maybe for a while I didn't think he was in danger, but you know, then he gets killed and turns out he was in danger. And Jon Snow, that character has a fear. Not a fear of death, but he understands. He fights, right? He's in the front line. He he's mm-hmm. killed people with his own hand, not by ordering a dragon to kill them. He has been injured. You know, we, he's he's. I mean, they both have suffered loss, but John is just a lot more realistic to me. And Daenerys, you know, you want to list all these accomplishments, but she wouldn't have, she wouldn't have had those accomplishments if she didn't have dragons. Like season one is her best season as a character because she grows and she accomplishes things on her own. Every other season it's because of her Unsullied or her dragons or Daria or Jorah. You know, that's why she's accomplishing the things she accomplishes. Whereas John, anything John's accomplished, it's been, it's been because of things that John did, physical actions that John took, you know? So maybe that's why it's hard for me to be invested in Daenerys. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But I'm sure we'll speak more of her when we cover John on our next episode. Are you looking forward to that, John? No, oh, I can't wait. We'll let you take the lead of that one because you're the uh, you're the resident Jon Snow historian. If the official, uh, I don't know, a Jon Snowian guru. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, thanks for listening. We greatly appreciate it. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash the promise princes. Follow us on Twitter at princess promise. Princess promised. Read the Westerosi companion, the princes that were promised.com. The podcast is available on Apple podcasts in the Google play store on Stitcher. We are on SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube. We are still on Instagram, but I haven't posted anything. Subscribe to our show, leave a review, make that review five stars. Thanks for listening, and we'll speak with you guys next time.